Tato. Welcome everyone to this um, the recommencement of this um, uh, long-term plan hearings. Uh, just uh, for the information of the other councillors, we have a, um, an apology from Councillor Elder today. She's, she, I thought she was feeling a bit cro looking, sounding a bit croaky yesterday. Well, she's come down with the lurk, so she's an apology for today's meeting. And our. Um, oh. Sure. Thank you, Councillor Lafiso. Right, our first um, submitter this morning is Mede Tana Juandes from the Corstaphine Community Hub. Welcome. Would you like to come up to the up to the front here? It's Kia ora. Welcome. Kia ora. Greetings to Lufalava, Malo Alale, and Tenakwe. Today I sit here on behalf of my Hapori and Fano. Uh, our submission to the Dunedin City Council's 10-year plan was the hope that our community and many others uh, alike would receive support and ensure its sustainability and to allow confidence for our whānau, our kaumātua and our tūinga mua, or future, to grow. Um, but realise the plan is to focus and create a permanent South Dunedin hub. This our whānau fully support, but also feel our hapuri that is actively helping struggling families and the community to bring free services such as nursery clinics, Kiwi Harvest Kai, distributed freely to the community, for school checks, a free lunch uh, held weekly, uh, to continue a sense of community and belonging, to fitness and yoga workshops, ensuring a whānau order approach, uh, to after school hub run with the support of uni crew, and many more free services. Uh, whilst we implore the ideal council has to make Dunedin a beautified city, we cannot help but feel other hubs such as ours will continue to struggle for funding and support. Um, it's not so much a handout, but more a hand up. Although Corstaphine has a community garden uh, established at the local funeral home, due to cultural beliefs, Fano will not utilise this and unfortunately will continue to struggle. Uh, feedback from Manuhiri during our community builders, who we spoke highly of the mana our hub Fano have. Uh, the relations within were clear and our Manuhiri could see the need to continue the work within this community. We have identified organisations that are already on the ground running and providing services need to have confidence in their council to continue to support whānau and hapori, but also acknowledge the hardworking individuals who talk to <coughs> also. Um, <coughs> Kostafin being an isolated suburb of Dunedin with no school due to its closure in 20, 2010 and only a takeaway dairy and second-hand store has little to offer local whānau. In 2013, it was brought to our attention that Fano struggled to attend medical appointments with members sharing their account of walking 6.2 kilometres from home to Dunedin Public Hospital with other children in tow. This clearly identified a need to bring other facilities to the community, so Fano implemented our Tikakono nurse-led clinic. Our Fano have come to the hub for support because there is no red tape, there is no questions asked, and the need for help is available at times immediately and our whānau are much like those who come to us and can identify with our own struggling families. Um, Hub was asked to vacate its Lockerbie Street facility in late 2017. Uh, this we accommodated and over a period of two months we were able to secure the Corstamine Community Centre. As we understand the building is not directly owned by council, it identifies the, uh, the building as in desperate need of repair. Its exterior and uh, is tired and worn, Portions of the roof have collapsed and the whole building is in need of TLC. Our internal structure is not much better. The electrical wiring is questionable due to the instability of the roof. Uh, the internal roofing sags due to the rain <laughs> and the hall is in the process of receiving a much needed look of paint. Our vision is to continue to build and create that which was intrinsic to us 30 years ago, a welcoming, supportive heart for Kostafine, not limited to the people who live here, but also to ensure a strong sense of belonging and community for our tamariki mukupuna and hina. We hope to have your support in the months to come and look forward to continuing our mahi. Uh, we have the seed, now help us grow. Mihi koe katoa. Thank you very much. Kia ora for that. Are you happy to take questions from the councillors? Yeah. Sure. Questions, councillors? 
Councillor O'Malley. Thanks, Thank you. Um, are you, are you, is one of the things you're asking for direct help with the building at the Course Defend Community Centre? The building and it's, uh, it's, it's space support, it's support with the gardens. Um, the idea of, of, of the funding um, to help sustain the garden or rebuild the garden because um, we previously in the Lockerbie Street facility had built a garden mm -hmm. um, but due to the move we haven't been able to establish it so the help um, to build the community will be the garden will be uh, a key factor as, as well if, yeah great okay yeah. thanks very much councillor Wiley um, thank you your worship um, me you, you talked about the community garden and the funeral home is there any other land or area that you have identified that you could use as a community garden? Yes, um, uh, the facility, we, the Corsifin Community Centre, um, we're able to, we've been um, able to secure that building um, and with the support of, of um, uh, connections, the, um, we've been able to establish that we can build and um, you know, uh, create our new garden. Um, with support of our families, up there. so yes, we can build on the on the facilities we're in now. And there'll be enough space for more than okay. enough. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. Kia ora, um, you, you, you said that the building is in a council-owned building, um, but beyond, and I think it's charitable to say, in desperate need of uh, some TLC. Um, but beyond that capital work doing up the building, um, are, there any, are, there, are there any challenges to the ongoing use of that building that you're facing at the moment, or is it, if, if, is it as simple as do up the building and it will all be fine? It, basically, it's as simple as doing up the building. We've, um, we've formed a new committee with the Cost of Ring Ratepayers and Residents Association. Um, so we've been able to um, bring our users together, um, form the committee with them as well. Um, prior to us um, forming this new committee, we had um, the, the other users of the hall had, had no say. So now we've incorporated this, we, we've, we are able to identify exactly what needs to happen. Um, and that's with the, the discussions with the other users. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? <coughs> there are none. Mere, kia ora for that. Thank you very much for your submission. Thank you. Appreciate it. Desiree Williams, Melcam Charitable Trust. <coughs> kia ora. Welcome. Kia uh, e ngā mana, e ngā reo, e rauranga tira mā, tēnā koutou. Ko Desiree Williams tōku ingoa, uh, ko Bex Twemlo tēnei. Um, we're here today on behalf of the Malcam Charitable Trust and we look to submit specifically to the Place-Based Community Grants Scheme proposal in the 10-year plan. Um, I will uh, follow Bex who will make our submission today with a couple of stories to highlight um, our position and points that we hope you receive. Kia ora. Good morning. We do acknowledge and celebrate the Dunedin City Council's intention to grow enterprise in Dunedin when we look to the place-based community grants scheme. We want to ensure that you consider the needs and future of youth in the design and implementation of the scheme. We do prefer the option of 300k per year as a minimum. And it is our submission that the fund should prioritise youth-orientated community-based groups who focus on social enterprise and work to build the financial capability of our youth. The fund can be used to create sustainable social enterprise for young people. The future of work is clearly and drastically changing, and this is not about developing young people who seek out jobs. Rather, working with them to recognise their strengths and arm them with transferable skills which allow them to create income or otherwise provide for their futures. Initiatives such as Malcam Trust Corfi Grove and others which connect youth to the land to give an example not only result in a sense of people care, food care and fair share, 
It provides skills in food growing, production and nutrition, knowledge of grounds maintenance. It lends itself to businesses such as healthy food packs, added value products, food trucks, farmers markets and restaurant supply. A chain system results, youth and communities develop skills and attitudes that they can then replicate in their life and their work. It is essential that the place-based community grants scheme is not limited by barriers in other areas of council or barriers external to council. The reality is that right now there is a bunch of red tape that we have to navigate. We implore our council to step this scheme out to ensure you understand how it will sit against the other council priorities and within your own various departments. If this scheme is established as a silo, it is not going to work as effectively as it will if there is a capacity across council to build this together. We also need the Dunedin City Council to advocate for support of enterprise external to the DCC. I would now like to reintroduce Desiree Williams, who will speak specifically to this challenge and her own recent experience. Kia ora. Uh, so I'd like to tell a couple of stories, and first of all, I need to um, give thanks for the significant support we do receive by Dunedin, from Dunedin City Council. We are privileged to be uh, housed in one of the old bowling clubs in Jubilee Park. We have a um, fabulous relationship and, in fact, a partnership with the Botanic Gardens with our grounds maintenance contract, which allows us to train young people uh, through the grounds maintenance team for six months and then get them into jobs and productive futures. Uh, we have many um, other examples of, of wonderful support from Dunedin City Council and I'd like to talk to two recent um, initiatives we've worked on. Uh, some time ago, last year, we got wind that uh, Dunedin City Council Botanic Garden was felling trees and that the contractor, Delta, would be allowed to take the rings of those trees away. Um, as we are a contractor to the Botanic Garden, we are also entitled to make a request to have the same right for that. So I rang the Botanic Garden and asked if we could please have the rings of the trees instead of Delta, no offence Delta, so that our young people could chop the rings, can't take branches, got to watch that health and safety, so t take the rings, chop the rings, and we would partner with the Dunedin Budget Advisory Service to give that firewood to Fano and Need. Um, we have entered an MOU, we have chopped many metres of wood, and already it's April and we have had four uh, requests for firewood um, from families through the Budget Advice Service. The reality is families were burning their bed bases and furniture last year to keep warm, so it's a wonderful way in which we can um, ensure that families in need are receiving some free assistance. We then heard, as a result, word gets out as it does, I received a phone call from a man who owns a company, Shep Pallets. His story, as he told me, and the waste management team at Council is aware of this, is that he is dropping, he is dumping around, and I could have the figure wrong, but it is a huge amount, around 70 cubic metres of broken, untanalised pallet, perfectly burnable to the tip every week. And he is looking for community groups that he could distribute those broken pallets to, to get them to families in need. The difficulty, of course, for us is we only have so much land and I don't really want huge amounts of pallets and health and safety and all of that. So I uh, actually referred him to a few others, including the community corrections team, uh, who do have quite a lot of land and who do uh, use the community-based, um, the community service uh, attendees to, to do kindling for Restore. <coughs> Unfortunately, in between my referring him to them and him speaking with them, um, he had looked at perhaps getting his own block of land, because it was all getting a bit hard, and selling the, the pallets. Um, and he was told by Otago Regional Council that because there is uh, less than 1% of non-toxic blue paint, which is the Shep pallet label, the brand, on the pallets, that he would not be able to do that. It's a significant opportunity to provide something wonderful to families in need that is missed. Uh, the other story I'd like to tell is the bike story. We've recently signed an MOU with the waste management team to collect the bikes from landfill and to restore those with our young people. Uh, 
the interesting point of that is that the landfill has stopped selling the bikes because they cannot guarantee the safety to people purchasing them, which seems a little ridiculous, but that is what it is. We would love to take those bikes. We've picked up the first 20 of those bikes and we would love to restore them. However, the arrangement has, has, to be, has had to be entered on the condition that we don't sell them, which limits us from being able to buy the parts that we need to make them safe for the people to ride. We've entered it anyway because we see significant benefit in being able to distribute bikes to young people in the community. Um, the other issue was that we were told we would need someone adequately qualified to service those bikes. So we are now, one of my staff is so passionate about it, he is personally paying to complete a qualification and travelling to Cromwell to do so through the Otago Polytechnic. But for his passion, our trust does not have the funding for such development. It's not a youth worker uh, qualification according to the De Department of Internal Affairs, so that initiative would have stopped if my team member was not so passionate about it that he was willing to um, pay that expense himself. Uh, those are just a few of our stories, and that is what we mean by the kind of red tape that we hit and the kind of support that DCC could give us. You're happy to take questions, I take it? Sure. Yeah. So can I kick off by asking, uh, going straight to that issue, I take it you're seeking, um, if you like, support from DCC vis-a-vis -vis some of those other authorities with regard to getting some sense uh, in the rules rather than seeking, it seems, one, I guess one way to deal with it is just to throw money at it, but the other way to deal with it is to question whether the rules um, may be made a little more flexible and you may need our assistance. Is that what you're asking for? Yes, I think we're asking for advocacy on the one hand yes. for external um, support and we're also asking for the various departments within council. We understand it's a big institution and we're asking for the various departments within council if we're going to proceed with a place-based community grant scheme that it is um, stepped out through the various departments so that it can be supported um, across the board rather than just throwing money at it and then finding that limitations are such that you are only get so far down the path. Right, okay, thank you. Further questions? Oh, um, Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and kia ora kora. Um, I have two questions. One is just picking up on that point um, and, you know, an institution-wide cultural shift would be nice, um, <laughs> but it, it, would it be more efficient to have uh, a single point of contact for whom that would be their role in supporting groups like yourselves to navigate those kinds of challenges? Uh, I, I, I personally, I don't, we haven't talked about that, yeah. but I personally would advocate for such a role um, because if you have someone that can knit it all together and navigate the pathways, those various departments, yeah. um, you know, even just sitting around this table can be uh, quite intense. Mm. It's a big ask. Not a lot of people can, can face up to such a setting. Mm. Um, so having somebody to walk alongside, uh, particularly our smaller community groups um, and, and our uh, diverse uh, peoples within Dunedin would be really helpful. Uh, and, and secondly, a higher level question, I suppose, beyond the regulatory um, <laughs> issues, what do you think would be the best thing? I'm, trying, I'm thinking about the city's social enterprise ecosystem at a, at a higher level, um, which I think offers huge potential, but um, untapped potential. What is the best thing we could do as a city, not necessarily as a council, um, to help support and foster that? Uh, well, absolutely, the city can play a role in ensuring that the infrastructure is there to allow those social enterprises to happen. Um, having people that understand the changing workforce within council and to not create this, the, the red tape around these opportunities uh, will make a, a significant difference. Um, telling those stories of the successful social enterprises that we do have in the city already and to highlight uh, you know, the, the process and the support that those enterprises have received from 
from uh, the city and outside of the council? Just one, just one more further on that. Um, in your opinion, uh, is it a different, is supporting and, and fostering social enterprise a different skill set uh, than you would expect someone to have that supported and fostered and mentored a tradi more traditional business model? Or are they transferable skills? I don't believe it's any different. That would be my own personal opinion. Okay. Thanks. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Your Worship. Kura, um, thanks for coming along. I'm interested in the story about the pellet firewood. Uh, I just want to make sure I've got it clear. So you had it potentially available, but it was ruled by the Regional Council that because there was some paint on it, a small amount, it couldn't be burnt. Correct. Toxic. And that's the same Regional Council that allows the burning of coal. Thank you. I'll talk that's to you about correct. That. I think it's one and the same. <laughs> And, and, the, and, the, and the somewhat comical thing about that is I'm not sure that anybody's going to be paid to run around firewood stacks checking yeah, pallets have got paint on them or not. It's more tragic than comical, thank you. Yeah. And the, never mind the toxicity of burning bed bases and furniture in the household. Can I just follow up on that and ask <laughs> what mechanisms are in place to stop you? I mean, it may be inadvisable <coughs> to, for instance, burn tantalised timber. But no one, there's no law against it. So I'm just wondering what the mechanisms. Ha that, that no, no, I appreciate that. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking. If you've, you've been told that, that you were not allowed to burn it, but who's enforcing that? And where, where are the rules? Where's the rule against it? I, it's a rhetorical question, but I don't believe there is one. Councillor Gary. No Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you for your submission. And my first question was asked by Councillor Hawkins around this contact. Um, but I just wanted to ask a detail about the wood. Was there any thought of you being able to extract the small portion that had the blue paint on it? Which was a logo, as I understood it. Yeah, so, so the, the reason that the pallets are going to the tip is because they're broken, and so you would, you would have to go Not through sure quite a lot of effort, I would suspect, to get mm. out those little bits of blue painted. Sure, sure. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thanks very much. Um, it, I'm just going to touch on the wood. Um, it is, in fact, the biggest source of methane. Timber is the biggest source of methane production in landfills, so I... It's a one diversion for another, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, my question really gets back to place-based groups. How do you see the Malcolm Trust um, interfacing with that grant system? Are you planning on um, trying to access that funding line, or are you planning on being on the side of it? Uh, I think it's probably too early days to determine how exactly we would be involved. Um, whether or not it is uh, by um, engaging with communities who are receiving that funding to um, work in collaboration with them, or whether it is uh, set up in such a way that we would um, meet the criteria of that fund. Um, I, th I think it's too, e too early to, to know what way we would take it. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly not standing here today um, saying that we will or won't you know, seek, seek funding. Specifically, it is about that social enterprise and the opportunity to build those alongside of the youth that are a part of Malcam Trust. <coughs> so, and then, and then I take your comments about red tape and other such things. So we do have in the e Economic Development Unit for businesses, <coughs> the red carpet system, which the idea is that, again, an individual is not going to understand the system. So you have someone inside who brings them through the whole system. Mm. Um, if we were to and do that kind of concept for um, social enterprise, what department would you like to see that in? Well, I, I refer back to the Councillor Hawkins' question, and, and I don't think the skills are any different, but there needs to be an understanding of the, the youth approach, uh, youth-led approach, perhaps, would be a better way to articulate that. But, but certainly the position where someone would effectively make sure mm -hmm. that any organisations that are interfacing with council mm -hmm. are not getting an accidental no sometimes too, whereas some yeah. person doesn't know and they give a no and that's the end of it. Mm. That kind of person would be very important. Yep. Okay, thank you. Councillor Staines. Just a question around the, the pallets. Were you aware that Cargill Enterprises for many years has broken up pallets and sold them firewood? 
Uh, yes, we were aware that Cargill Enterprises is, is, selling, uh, has, is receiving pallets. My understanding is they're, they're breaking up whole pallets, which um, yeah, allows them to remove the, the element that isn't allowed. Mm. Is that we, broken? We break up broken pallets. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I also understand that Cargill Enterprises was one of the groups that Shep Pallet had spoken to. We're not the only group that they've approached. Yeah. No more questions? Thank you very much for your submission, and we've got a little bit to follow up on. I think. Thank you. All right, good. Good. Um, Mr Naidu. Kia ora, welcome. Kia ora. Good morning all. Uh, so this is the first slide up. So just to give our, our submission a bit of context, uh, on the PowerPoint there uh, shows the organisations that belong to the Dunedin Migrant Sector Partners. Um, and to give some context around this, uh, discussions uh, uh, regarding our submission have been had uh, at, at that group, including those organisations there. Clearly, there will be a conflict of interest for some organisations to be to be signatories to the submission, and indeed the written submission that's to follow, uh, for a for a variety of reasons. Uh, so not all of them are included as signatories in the submission. So this submission outlines the areas in which we believe council needs to focus, with particular reference to newcomers and migrants. It is not sufficient to concentrate attention solely on attracting newcomers. We need to give equal emphasis to welcoming and retaining them. As such, we recommend the creation of a council migrant and newcomer settlement and labor market attraction team. We recommend that such a team develops an international action plan relating to migration and settlement with two key objectives. Number one, to drive collaborative action between the econo economic and community, community development teams in a robust way. This does not presently appear to be the case. Secondly, to fully implement the various council initiatives already identified in the following strategies. If you can give me the next slide, please. I stress that these are initiatives that have already been identified by council. Um, so talking th through some of them, uh, of course, the, economic, uh, the EDS, you will notice that under the hub for skills and talent, uh, there's a, t a tailored settlement process component. Moving on to the compelling destina destination, you'll also notice that there is pr um, a component for migrant promotion and attraction efforts. Once again, a stress already identified initiatives by the council. Also, from the social well-being strategy, uh, which focuses on hospitality and care, uh, we have not been able to ascertain yet whether the Manaki Tanga Pathways team has been established and whether work has begun on the needs analysis and development of an action plan, which we think are essential. These two things were actually uh, two of, of many actions identified in the Manaki Tanga Pathways um, action plan. The uh, arts and culture strategy of, of interest here is that the definition encompasses community and professional activities, including creative technologies and knowledge-based industries. So the definition is pretty broad-based. In our view, our proposed team should also take into account the following. The need to communicate settlement information effectively, example information about NGOs and other community organizations supporting newcomers. We desperately, we desperately need to revisit and act on the settling in report. Council is well aware of this report, um, and certainly the, uh, the community development team. 
There needs to be consultation on other strategies, including the Western Bay of Plenty International Strategy, which is owned and facilitated by Priority One. I won't go into too much detail around that, except to say it does support and interacts with a range of other local initiatives and strategies, as, as well as aligning with the government of New Zealand's investment attraction strategy. Also, clo a closer to home example, is the Southlands Economic and Community Development Teams are now sited closely together to allow for co collaboration on migrant matters. Southland has also opted into the government's Welcoming Communities Program. Uh, this program, uh, in a nutshell, provides standards for what a welcoming community looks like. We recommend that Council puts Dunedin on the waiting list for the potential national rollout of this program and implements already identified best practice from that pilot program. Council might also like a link into government initiatives, which supports regions in the quest to increase migration and to access assistance from central government. Slide three, please. Example, uh, Venture Southland, for instance, instance act actively seeks government support and has either initiated or is taking part in government-supported migra migration initiatives as shown on this PowerPoint. I'm certainly not going to go through all of them, but that gives you an idea of how much buy-in that council has to what we've pr proposed here. Both of these regions have done extensive labor, labor market research to support their labor market plans. Uh, I pose a question, has council undertaken similar, similar research for Dunedin? We should also not forget the more than 350 former refugees that, are, that have already arrived over the past two years. And we need to work to ensure the continued welcome and ongoing integration and resettlement of, of former refugees, including the provision of adequate funding for integration purposes. Including the funding for, of adequate, uh, uh, including adequate funding for integration purposes. I pause for effect. <laughs> so, in conclusion, we ask Council to show public leadership, and, as you have been doing, but, but in a, in, by, by vigorously promoting migration to the city. With this comes the need to, to have a coordinated, to have coordinated services in place to not just attract migrants, but to welcome and retain migrants once they arrive. Whilst Council's focus in the 10-year plan is on spending much on physical infrastructure, it is essential to develop and strengthen social infrastructure for migrants and newcomers. Much of this has already been identified in the social well-being strategy. So I won't go into that. Uh, Council must supply sufficient financial and other resources to provide first-class newcomer migrant sector support. Uh, please note that we will be making a formal, more robust written submission. And all of the strategies and uh, initiatives, initiatives by other councils are cited and referenced adequately. So I, I hope you will give that written submission the attention it deserves once, once received. I thank you for taking the time to consider our, our verbal submission. Thank you very much. Um, can I just kick off the questions yes. by asking I take it that what you're telling us about, by using the example of Venture Southland, mm. that there is central government resource available if you ask for it to Absolutely. do some of the things or put some of the support in place that you're talking about or you're advocating for. Absolutely. Case in point, the Welcoming Communities uh, Program, uh, Council has got to actively opt into it. Right. Okay. It doesn't find Council. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much for taking the time to come along and make a submission. So in asking the question I'm about to ask, I ask it in the context of having been involved in a local uh, settlement program on a voluntary basis, and I want to explore the accompanying spouse job search assistance point you make. Um, can you tell us about how the importance of that and any stories you might have about where that hasn't worked, where a, a company spouse hasn't got a job and the impact of retaining the migrants? I am indeed pleased that you've asked such a question. We know that often the primary applicant may find jobs, and we've, uh, let me quote a, a real example. There was someone who found a job in the IT, in the IT sector. His wife was highly educated. Uh, she found it difficult to integrate. 
to make social connections, to make professional co connections, and indeed to find a job. This guy chose to leave Dunedin simply because his wife was not happy, the accompanying spouse. Um, I know the University of Otago has some sort of initiative to address this. I don't think there's a citywide initiative to address this. It is major, and, and you know, no person is going to stay in the city if his family is not happy, in spite of how much he gets in his paycheck. Good question. Thank you for asking it. So just to tease yeah. that out a bit further, yeah. if families have children in school, yeah. that helps a little bit, but isn't the final answer for the spouse? No, uh, of course, of course, that also uh, is important. And, and, uh, and them having a sense of belonging is also important. And of course, having a sense of belonging, um, what contributes to that is actually the social and professional interactions and also feeling that you have some worth and are contributing to, to society. These, the, these things that I've just mentioned have come out clearly in feedback we have received. I've, I've experienced that and seen that, yes. and you're absolutely right. Thank you yeah. so much for that story. Further questions, councillors? <laughs> there are no further questions. Thank you very much for your, um, for your submission and for your suggestions. We, we, we will follow up on some of those. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Um, Ms Hood, Lindley Hood. Kia ora Lindley, welcome. Kia ora tato. Thank you for this opportunity. Last November, Chris Ford and I combined our experiences of community activism and disability to form the Pedestrian Action Network. And the response from so many smart, well-informed, passionate and opinionated individuals and groups left us in no doubt that we'd struck an important chord. I'll run through some bullet points and put the details in our written submission. I'm wearing my canaries in the coal mine badge because we elderly and disabled pedestrians are the canaries in the coal mine of Dunedin's future. Get it right for us and you won't be caught short as the population ages and the sea level rises. We want what everyone wants, a livable, accessible, inclusive, healthy, resilient and sustainable city. And that means a walkable city. As the gap between rich and poor widens, wheeled transport of every sort further separates the haves from the have-nots. But walking is democratic, with safe, pleasant places to stroll, people of all ages and abilities and incomes and cultures can mix and mingle and get to know each other better. We've had a taste of the good things to come with the temporary pedestrianisation of the railway station carriageway and the lower octagon and the reintroduction of the Barnes dance. We totally agree with your worship who told Radio New Zealand, and I quote, Making the lower octagon pedestrian only for a weekend provided a glimpse into a poten potential future for the central city. There could be a push from some parts to make it a permanent future. A lot of us have been saying for years that it's a no-brainer. So I wasn't surprised by the headline next day, George Street could be pedestrianised, but that was in the Edinburgh Evening News. They're all doing it. I'd like to invite our Mayor to sign Walk 21, the International Charter for Walking. It's a common policy reference informed by experts from 40, 35 countries that provides a framework to help authorities focus their policies, activities and relationships on creating a culture where people choose to walk. It's already been signed by 500 Mayors from around the world. We'd love you to sign it too. 
In practical terms, the challenge ahead for Dunedin is that our car-dominated city has the worst safety record in the country. As you can see on the graph I've distributed, the one in your um, document on infrastructure, background one on infrastructure for the 10-year plan, has got a graph showing the road safety has improved. But that's just for the local roads. And this is, graph is for local and state highways. And of course, part of the problem is, is that a lot of accidents happen at intersections between local roads and state highways. So depending on which box you tick, it could be either way. But the important thing is that Dunedin families, Dunedin people, Dunedin's health system, and the ease of getting around that suffers when we have all these accidents. In DCC's integrated transport strategy, the road safety goal was by 2024, the number of fatal and serious injury crashes in Dunedin will have decreased by 50% relative to 2014 levels. Well, as you can see from the graph, it's actually got worse. The best thing to do now is to ask the pedestrians, and especially the elderly and disabled pedestrians who are not allowed to drive or are too scared to drive or are a menace on the road. Along with our mokapuna who are too young to drive and their parents and teachers, we know all about the barriers to catching buses and walking. A good starting point would be to prioritise pedestrian safety and have pedestrian advocates at the table from the earliest stages of all transport planning. Don't go building cycleways and calling them shared paths without consulting the people you're supposed to be sharing them with. And don't go building roads or even making decisions about sealing or painting roads without consulting the people whose modest but very reasonable ambition is to get from one side of the road to the other without getting run over. And please think beyond walking and cycling. Please factor in all the skateboards, segways, roller skates, push scooters, mobility scooters, packsters, and so on, that are stressing out pedestrians who no longer have the reflexes to leap out of the way. We need space to keep our most vulnerable pedestrians safe, and space for all these other things, as well as for cyclists. And that means less space for cars. We can't wait to become as congested as Auckland or Queenstown. We can't wait for another Ed Sheeran concert. We need to start now. The move to a pedestrian-friendly city doesn't appear in the draft 10-year plan. Please put it there. It's happening anyway. It'll future-proof our city, and it needs to be properly planned. Thank you. Um, going back to your um, suggestion of, a, of my signing the walking charter, I'd be most appreciative of getting a link to that so that Good. I'd can consider that, so right. appreciate that. Thanks. Councillor Benson Pope. Um, thank you for your um, very positive comments. Um, in respect of the comment you made at the end about the absence of pedestrianisation from the plan, um, if I were to tell you that one of the possible outcomes of the expenditure on the central city uh, were a much higher level of pedestrianisation, would that be something that you would um, support, I assume. Oh, that's excellent. And it's, it's conceivable that the funding for communities may apply and that, you know, the government funding, I, I don't know. Um, but there's certainly previously, the previous government um, bracketed walking and cycling but funded only cycling. But I think that's going to change too. So. There's, you know, the possibility for more useful funding. And just further to that, the um, the positive comment that you started with about 
the effect of the trial and the octagon, that's yeah. something that you believe we should move on sooner rather than later also? Oh, absolutely, Thank yes. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Lindley, for your really clear submission. Um, I have a question um, which is just to reflect some uh, submissions, other submissions that we've had. So I can see that you share the excitement around the trial pedestrianisation of the octagon, but one of the bits of feedback we had was from those who perhaps are not able to walk very far. Um, because they're elderly or have a disability, have mobility issues, who fear the pedestrianisation, increased pedestrianisation. What would you say to that? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm on the um, DCC Disability Issues Advisory Group through visual impairment. And um, when pedestrianisation has been discussed, we s certainly... Um, there, it's, it's not a, actually an either-or thing. Uh, the way it's been planned in places where it works, you've usually got till 10 o'clock in the morning for deliveries to shops and so on, and after a certain hour in the evening. But there'll be pick-up and drop-off places for people with disabilities. And um, But it, the setting will be so full of um, planter boxes and cafe tables and what have you that anybody in a car will be crawling along thinking, should I even be here? But they will come in and drop off someone who can't walk and go away and park somewhere else. The point is, people. Um, and when it was raised about pedestrianising the St Clair um, Esplanade, there, there were comments I noted online of people saying, but the elderly and disabled want to be able to drive there. No, we don't. We want to be able to stroll around there without getting run over. We can get somebody to drop us off and just have a nice little walk in their seats and, the, you know, it, it, it can work for both. I hear what you're saying. Um, one person that approached us at one of the consultations is highly distressed about this and felt very, very excluded. So do you think perhaps that it's around the communication of that wider concept that's yes. the issue as opposed to that there really is an issue? Yeah. There's, there's also a sense it's... Yeah, it, we're so not used to walking anywhere that I know it was raised with me, but we need more parking at the hospital because I have to draw, take my mum who can't walk. And, you know, and I go, but you can walk. <laughs> and you can, you know, take it and, and then go and park somewhere else and walk back. You don't actually need two-hour parking. Providing you can leave them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's room for everyone, is what you're saying. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. One more question, Councillor O'Malley. Um, thanks, Lindley, for your thing, for your presentation. I know you're, you're talking at some point there about what I think looks like public consultation. Um, I have seen in the past sometimes <coughs> that we, we, as a council, will tend to come out fairly late in the development process and then ask the public what they think. Yeah. Um, so, what would you, if we, let's say, as an example. We're talking about the Octagon or George Street. When would you like to see the public consultation start on what the vision of that would be like? I, I think at the concept stage, you've got to have pedestrian... If you're talking to the NZTA and the AA and spokes, you've got to have pedestrian advocates there around the table right from the very beginning. So that's a that's more of a stakeholders that's a stakeholders Absolutely. consultation. Yes. And then what about general public consultation? Um, I haven't thought that far. Oh, okay. But yes, yeah, it's. Uh, but certainly it, it, stakeholders, it, it, has and to, you want to make sure that in the stakeholders, pedestrians are included. Of course, in that group. of course. I mean, they're the greatest road users of the lot. Yeah. 
Thanks. And I'm just looking at your figure here. It's 35 incidents for every 10,000 people, so that would be 450, 420 for 120,000 people, is that? Yeah, and that's, that's the police reported accidents, which, at least for pedestrians, covers less than half of the, the number who are hospitalised through pedestrian accidents. So that's more than one a day. Do you know what the casualty, what the threshold for a casualty is? Um, a serious casualty under the Ministry of Transport is somebody who's admitted to hospital. Mm -hmm. And those are, compared to the hospital discharge statistics for people involved in motor vehicle accidents, um, the police reported ones are under count by quite a big, big number. And we are, as you show here, we are persistently the worst yeah. in the country. Yeah, yeah. And the only one that's over 30 per 10,000 population. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Lily, thank you for your submission, and I'd appreciate that yeah. link sometime. Right. So. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Medlicott. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. I thought I should, um, but before I start, uh, give a quick call out for what Lindley has just been speaking about and offer a bouquet for the uh, traffic timing that's been done in the warehouse precinct and in particular the pedestrianisation of Jetty Street. That is a wonderful model. I live and work there and uh, my hat is off to the council for a job extremely well done. So thank you very much. Kia ora. Thank you for that. Um, but with the bouquets I'm afraid there do come some brickbats and you, I dare say you've read my submission. <laughs> And I'm concentrating on one very small aspect of the proposed 10-year plan. I declare personal interest in this uh, because I have a development which is stalled as a result. That is the state of sewage in Kaikaro Valley. The current situation is that there is significant water infiltration at times of rain into the Kaikaro Valley sewage system which overloads the tunnel um, pipework running out to Surrey Street and we have the horrors of overland sewage flows in South Dunedin. Council has a four stage plan currently to address water infiltration in Kaikaro Valley although the last stage has been put off for a year because the contractors weren't available or the cost of it was too, too great. I'm not quite sure which. Word from the contractors, I understand it, that situation is not going to improve. In the meantime, uh, we have an ongoing problem. I have a request to council to uh, rezone my part of land in Bar Street, Mercer Street area. I've got four hectares, perversely zoned rural, that I wish to see zoned residential. And the thing that is providing the greatest pushback from council, in fact, the only thing is the state of the sewage infrastructure. So you can imagine that I was really excited to see that council is proposing to take the whole flow from Kaikoura Valley and pump it to Green Island. Fantastic, really wonderful idea. And can I say I'm totally in support of it. Not only for my own moderately selfish reasons, although the economics of uh, land development are very, very thin um, and the first six sec sections I've developed in the area have run at a loss. But it's also a matter of our civic responsibility, I, I suggest, Mr Mayor. We have a responsibility to not pollute. We have a problem where we've got overflows running into Kaikarai Stream Admittedly, that's not so bad when the rivers are high and everything's getting washed away, but it's still an offensive issue. But moreover, we have people's homes being flooded in South Dunedin. 
and that has arisen from deferred maintenance over the years in, in the Kaikoura Valley catchment, uh, deterioration of infrastructure, and it's our responsibility as ratepayers, councillors, chief executive, to address that. And my submission, this work needs to be brought forward as a matter of some urgency. Um, and if I can talk a bit about the 10-year plan, that we want it needed to be a great small city. Well, it's a wonderful thing, and we're seeing bits of it. There's some of that feel-good factor that we're seeing in the Heritage Precinct Stadium and so forth. You know, it does have that wow factor, and it does feel great. I'll give you that. But if we want to be a truly great city, let's take a look at perhaps the greatest city of them all, Rome. Long before, 800 years before the Colosseum, they had the Cloaca Maxima, the great sewer of Rome, that has been built on and improved right through its history, combined with aqueducts, providing sanitation and good clean water to the populace. The Romans understood the needs of the populace. And if we want to be great, I think we must emulate the Romans. So, the other responsibilities, I think, that we must address. We must address the need to uh, allow the city to grow. Day before yesterday, paper, 840 uh, people to be accommodated for the hospital rebuild. It's going to take land. It's going to take greater development. Kaikoura Valley is going to be one of those places. Whether it's my sections or not, it's, it's rather beside the point. It's going to mean more people in that catchment, adding more uh, sewage, more grey water, and exacerbating the flooding issue. We're seeing greater industrial development in the area. It's got to be accommodated. Um, the plan talks about $7 million to pump from the current end of the uh, pipe at the Caversham Tunnel out to the Green Island wastewater treatment plant. And then there's a significant amount planned for the upgrade of that plant itself. Now, as I understand it, and I'm not a water engineer, but my understanding is that the flow from Kaikoura Valley could be treated there. And at times of heavy rain, I imagine that the excess flow going through the currently going through the Cavisham Tunnel could be directed to um, Green Island and, if necessary, directly out to sea. Um, that would be preferable to overland flows in South Dunedin, frankly. It's what's happening now with the overflows into the Kaikarai stream in any case. And it, what I'm suggesting to you is while that's not ideal and that the cost of doing up the uh, Green Island plant is relatively significant, uh, this is a step that can be taken now to alleviate a significant problem and meet um, our responsibilities to ensure that we don't um, pollute at least the homes of the people in South Dunedin and that we can meet our responsibilities to allow sustainable development in the city. Those are my submissions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, questions, Councillor Lord. I was just going to ask the question or, or phrase it in such a way, but the Green Island upgrade, that is planned, but it is about taking the time to get the planning and do the job properly. So would you rather we rushed ahead and got it wrong or prime, planned properly and did it properly? That is a totally unfair question. I'll, I'll respond to that question the way I think I should respond to it. Council has had ample opportunity to get on and plan it. It doesn't take a great deal to plan these things. It certainly doesn't take five years to make a start. And in my submission, that amount of flow from the um, Kaikoura Valley catchment could readily be um, diverted out there at times of heavy rain. There's no reason you can't have both systems running simultaneously. But you can certainly have a pressure line heading out to um, the Green Island plant to take the um, excess flow when it rains. Can I just make the point that um, I, I, 
appreciate that you're making all your comments in good faith, but mm. uh, at, at a, as, as a governance body, we are not in a position to be on top of the operational yeah. details as much as... Well, that's right. So, but it is important to know the planning is well underway. It didn't take five years to make a start. The planning's well underway. That piece of work that got deferred, the large piece of yes. new build, because we only got one tender and it was 50% above what, he, what all of us knew that it should cost. So it got deferred until and broken down a different way to try and help us get more tenderers. That's part of the project. So you know, there's a whole lot of things that fall out one after the other after the other yes. and the Green Island build. So it is on a trajectory to get built as quickly as we could. The, yeah. There is no sitting around waiting for planning. That, that It is well underway, just as well, a matter of thank, interest. Thank you for that, although I should point out that I, I watched the um, use around the Kaikoura Valley sewage works assiduously. And the first time I saw any mention of the Green Island upgrade and a pressure line to it was in the very recent um, detail in the 10-year financial plan uh, and going through council hearings for um, changing of zoning under the 2GP, we were operating on the basis that we had a four-stage plan, the last of which was the replacement of a number of pipes within Kaikoura Valley down to the Cavisham Tunnel. There was no mention at all of the pressure line proposed out to Green Island and when I've seen that I've gone Yahoo, this is a solution. Let us, uh, let us embrace it as quickly as possible. It's actually, it's been under discussion for some decades, actually. Interestingly, so the staff were advising me that the reason that was not done in the first place is that when the Green Island sewage treatment station was built, that was in the old days when it was Green Island Borough, mm. and there was discussions from the city then to say the most effective way to deal with Kaikoura Valley sewage was to pump it to Green Island Borough, and Green Island Borough declined to take our sewage. So it's been on the books for decades, and the right. planning began some years ago. Well, uh, thank you for that detail. No more questions? Count, ca ca oh, Councillor O'Malley. Um, it's actually a question of the Chief Executive. Thanks. Yeah. Um, is it possible we could sometime have a workshop on, on how this is all working out, like the relationship between Surrey Street, Cavisham Tunnel, KV3, and, and so we can, from a governance perspective, have a clear understanding of how sure. it's all coming together? Mr. Medlicott, thank you very thank much you. for your, and I think you'll find that your um, ambitions with regard to this coincide with oh. ours. So. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Kia ora, David. Welcome. Kia ora, thank you. Um, I understand we have five minutes? Yep. yep. I'll, I'll try and be as quick as possible. I would encourage you to read our full submission, as, uh, as yep. wordy as it is, though. Uh, I'll just skip over the, um, the, uh, the key points. So I'm here, I'm a Senior Policy Advisor for Federated Farmers of New Zealand. I'm representing uh, here, uh, presenting our submission on behalf of Federated Farmers. Um, just to start off, rates increases. Uh, Short story is we can think we think that uh, rates increase of 7.3 percent proposed for this year is too high. Uh, we congratulate council on its austerity over the past five years. Three percent rates increase and getting on top of infrastructure, reducing debt, uh, getting through the district plan that has been quite an achievement. Uh, but we don't think it's quite time to open up the barn doors yet. And we've got concerns around the implication of coming out and saying we're we're back in business now with 7.3 percent increase is that next year there will be a, a whole heap of other uh, projects which people will think will, will also uh, deserve um, funding. Uh, that's particularly a concern when you look at the, the long-term projections of the plan. Um, Council is indicating its uh, reliance on rates as a proportion of operating revenue is going to increase from 57% in 2018 to 67% by 2028. That means that rates will take a greater burden of any additional spending. Um, and at the same time, the LTP, LTP is indicating that uh, Council is going to be pushing hard against debt limits, uh, particularly from 2021 onwards. We've supported Council's um, specific rate in, uh, increase cap of 3% over the years because it's been very useful uh, as a guide for the community and, and Council in those discussions. It's been, it's been very hard for Council, I imagine. But it's been clear to ratepayers that if you come up and have a conversation about what additional spending you want, 
then we're going to have to reprioritise. Uh, we think there's the same approach should continue uh, with a slightly uh, increased rates cap, for, for example, 4.5 per cent. Says um, we've been through those all three years. We're going to free the reins a little bit, um, but uh, not to the extent that we're increasing rates by 7.3 per cent. Um, and Council's uh, page 12 of Council's consultation document indicates just uh, I, I appreciate that percentages are one thing. Uh, page 12 of Council's in, um, consultation document indicates just the dollar value amounts. Some commercial ratepayers are looking at many thousand dollar increases. Some farmers are looking at uh, increases as well in advance of a thousand dollars. So those increases will have a, a, a genuine impact. Uh, part of the reason um, those high value properties are facing higher rates is because of the Council's funding policy around the community services rate. Uh, Council's policy is that community services rate will only increase by CPI inflation. That's a lot lower than the proposed rates increase. And the result is that um, any additional rate spending gets pushed on to the general rate, which is property value based. I don't think there's anyone who could argue that Council shouldn't be concerned about the rates affordability of those on low value pro properties. However, uh, we don't think the rating uh, approach is the best way of dealing with those. I think targeting those who rates for missions uh, central government's rates rebate scheme, uh, or, or as I'm about to uh, address, having specific targeted rates for some of these uh, very specific development projects uh, is a good way to go rather than playing around with the CPI. Uh, in terms of other funding policy areas, um, we understand Council's been through a bit of a uh, ringer around the tourism economic development rate. Um, just having a look at the benefits of the economic, economic development act activity, I think um, it, it becomes clear that the economic development activity is uh, much more a, um, a general public good benefit activity. What is, um, is really uh, worth targeting is the uh, marketing to need and activity, which does provide a direct commercial benefit to specific ratepayers. And I can appreciate some commercial um, operators would be concerned about the, the growth in Airbnb, the sharing economy and how that may impact them. Uh, Queenstown Lakes District Council have just been through a district plan process where they've attempted to define, set a line for that um, and, and capture that uh, sharing economy. And I think that is, uh, going into the future, that is something that Council should also consider. Um, but I think... Having a specific targeted rate is not just about the incidence of cost, it's all about giving those uh, people who are paying some additional control over where it's spent. And I think um, I understand from the submissions at the start of the week, uh, that's what they're also asking for. So if you are reviewing that activity, we'd ask that you also review the rating of it as well. Uh, specific projects. Um, some key capital expenditure projects uh, consulted upon. Um, the first is the bridge and the central city upgrade. Um, again, these upgrades, while providing some general benefit to the, the city overall, um, they do provide direct benefit to what I would consider to be geographically defined areas and, and those should be subject to a targeted rate. Again, Queenstown Lakes has a good example through its CDB, uh, CBD development targeted rates. And what that targeted rate does is it puts the instance of costs on those areas that are going to directly benefit doesn't have to be the entire uh, cost. Um, and it also um, means that the general rate payer isn't paying. And again, there's some direct connection between the, the spending and, and what is um, uh, what the, the final outcome is. Um, and it's, it's very heartening to hear that uh, you know, organisations like Naitahu uh, are stepping forward and willing to partner on some of that spending. I think that's a great approach. And it could, does justify our council maybe stepping back a bit and, and deferring the spending for a few years or a year or so. Um, tertiary precinct upgrade is a similar concern. Um, while those, the university and Polytech are a huge asset to the city, um, they don't pay rates. Uh, and and they're, they're going to commercially benefit from having a, a better, um, you know, better precinct. Uh, so we think there should be a limited rating contribution towards those upgrades we think should be a partnership approach and if rates increases can't be pegged back I think that that is one thing that needs to be deferred. Uh, on a more positive note um, we support Council's uh, 
putting two, $200,000 a year into the uh, place-based community grant scheme uh, for the next three years, and we support. The, we think that's a good sort of uh, facilitative way of, of funding some of those community grants or community projects, and we support the, the proposal to sell commercial property uh, in order to reduce rates and impact. I'd welcome any questions. Just to kick off, um, going back to the <coughs> tertiary precinct proposed spending, you'll be, I take it you're aware that the spending will be on the public realm, it'll be on streets, not on, um, not on university property. Yes. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is I, I imagine you're aware, you, you point out quite rightly, that the university doesn't pay general rates. But you'd also be aware, I, I take it, and you'd expect us to take into account the fact that that heavily, um, intensively developed um, residential area pays a considerably higher amount of rate per air, per square metre, if you like, than any other part of town. Because of the property value base rates, uh, well, yes. Be because of the, well, the property value because it's so intensively yep. developed. So the, the, you'd be aware that the rate take per hectare of residential land is probably three times what it is in any other part of town. Yeah, I remember paying rates when I was down, uh, rent, sorry, when I was down yeah, there as yes. well, and uh, I, can, I can imagine that it's reflected in the cost of rent as well. So, yes. so, so, yeah. so what I'm, I'm just pointing out yeah. that despite the fact that the university doesn't pay rates, actually that area of the city uh, pays, uh, you know, contributes an enormous amount. Yes, yes, certainly. And that's why we're not saying don't do it at all or no. just leave it to them. Uh, let's facilitate a discussion and if it is going to happen, um, then, then push it down the, the track a bit uh, and prioritise rates and, increases. And, and, and we have, in fact. Um, you'll be aware also that the university uh, has con uh, invested in the public realm mm. uh, quite a lot. So. Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you, David. Um, just. I've just finally received some information I've been asking for the, um, to ask this, this type of question. Um, a 1% rate increase amounts to an additional revenue of about 1.4 million. We could, and it's just, with some of the projects, we're actually targeting to grow the rate base, which is something I think the Federated Farmers had, in the past would have been happy with. And so rather than targeted rate saying that, can we get another 1.4 million dollars worth of development in all, or, or, of rateable property, um, or rates from rate, uh, increasing the rateable property. Now, I, I'm just wondering, and, as, and we, we've heard you before at the Ratings Working Party, so I know that you know you understand these things, and I'm not articulating necessarily well, but if we could get another 500 or 600 houses, for example, that would be a 1% rates drop, or not have a rates rise. Does that make sense? Mm. And so, some, some of these initiatives are considered in that light that they won't happen of their own necessarily, but we'd be wanting to have some certainty that you'd get, and commercials are actually substantially higher rate take, obviously. Um, and with that in mind, would you see that some of these projects would be beneficial and not necessarily require a um, targeted rate? I think there's two points to that. Well, first is the conundrum facing local government in terms of uh, economic development um, and how much um, spending $1.4 million of ratepayers' money will encourage people to come to need. Mm -hmm. I, I sit down and look at all these LP, LTPs and every council has the same, uh, same agenda and same argument. Um, and so I think to a certain extent you can, development of that nature happens without uh, council intervention. I also think it relies very, very heavily on the quality of infrastructure uh, that council's putting in place. And so what we're saying in our submission is just focus on the infrastructure first and foremost. Um, economic development spend, or, or, or spending on infrastructure in specific areas in a way to promote growth, yes. Um, and, and when you, you go to a, 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 um, a targeted rating approach for something like the, the bridge, uh, you, you would provide a component of it through the general rate and also a component of the target rate, so it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's mm -hmm. just the, the, the combination of the both. We're saying just, just shift the incidents more to those that are going to benefit directly. If I own a property down on uh, down on the, the bridge, the wharf area, I'm probably going to benefit relatively more than the general rate payer um, from uh, development down in that area. 
and that's the, the, the thinking behind the, uh, the Queenstown Lake CBD rate as well. So, yes, there is some general good uh, yep. to council's development and spending, even the infrastructure spending, but not all of it is, is general good. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Great to see you in a different forum. <laughs> um, my question's around your promotion of the greater use of targeted rates, which obviously have a statutory limit, but that's not really an issue in this, um, in this instance, I don't think. But whether you, and they tend to be, the ones we do have tend to be um, flat taxes, essentially, like a, a fixed sum per household unit or, or, or whatever. Um, but would you... Is that what you're advocating for, or would you also support using targeted rates that were also tied to capital value within that catchment area? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. And I think um, that distinction around the legislative cap is for uniform rates, so I think you can use property value-based targeted rates as much as you like. Uh, but yeah, those you, the flat taxes, as you say, um, there is a cap on that. Yep. Councillor Lord. Yeah, um, thanks for coming, David. Um, no, look, my question is, is um, similar, but it's in, we've had questions asked about the upgrade of the CBD and, and whether we spend 60 million or 35 and a half or whatever it is, but the, the question I'd have is what, if you were talking about um, targeted rates for those that are deemed beneficiaries, what percentage of, say, a $60 million upgrade would you feel you could levy on the business owners, say, for example, versus the greater district that live there. You know, I mean, look, there's no doubt about it that even I, as a farmer from the other end of the end of the catchment, still get a benefit from that and nicer amenity values and all those sort of things. But where would you have a, a view about what percentage of a upgrade might be targeted back to the to the owners in in the immediate group? It's, it's a very, it's a, that's a very good question and it's a, a complex one because I think it has to pass two, it has to test, it has to pass the, 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 the sort of the logical test, what, um, what benefits, what proportion of this development will benefit those in the direct area. Um, and I generally, I think something like 60-40, 70-30 is generally the split that most councils use in terms of um, those specific area based development. If, if, again, if you look at um, Queenstown Lakes, I think they've gone even further. I think it's quite considerably uh, upon that area, but they've got different demographics, uh, and probably those um, in that area probably have a bit of ability to pay the costs. Um, it also has to pass the sniff test. So if you've got a development in the area, um, it's going to mean a $6,000 increase in rates for a, a one individual property. You're probably going to say, even though it's logically um, we, we developed the right split, um, this just is not acceptable. Uh, so we'll, we'll shift it back onto the general rate. But I, I, I think generally, and, and this goes to um, uh, other council functions where there's a component of general benefit um, and specific benefit, and that includes um, you know, regional council's functions around uh, monitoring, regulatory monitoring. 60-40 um, or 70-30 seems to be the general split, um, with the, the, the smaller amount being the general public good. But again, it depends on the specific project in question. Uh, you might say that developing a bridge uh, will provide um, some significant benefit to the to the uh, those down in the in the in that area, um, but it's not going to be that significant. There's already a bridge; they're not going to benefit that much. So we'll just uh, it'll be slightly less. Yep. Councillor O'Malley. Thanks, David, for your submission. I, I'm going to ask a question of the CEO that. Um, it relates to a question I got asked that relates to your submission around the tertiary precinct um, and relative contributions. We know that the University and Politic don't pay rates on their academic and research buildings. Do they pay rates on commercial residential buildings that they own, like flats? Uh, yeah, but I think we were getting you that answer, so let me just check. I think the answer is yes, but I'll just check. We'll, we'll get that through to you in today. Great, thank you. Councillor Benson Park. Thank you, Your Worship. Just coming back, David, to the your public-private um, allocations there. Which way around are they? 
Well, yeah, that, that's that's the tricky part. I think, I think it, it well, is. You talked about seventy thirty and sixty forty. But which is the public? Well, I think it is. It, it is project specific, and the, the the point is that council should have been through this process already. Well, well, that's you're, it, you're, what section one of the local government act when says. When the current work was done, um, the um, owners of the property in George Street were charged on a linear per metre basis of their frontage for a small contribution, nowhere near twenty percent of the cost of the work. Well, sorry, what current work <coughs> was that? When the current paving was done in George Street, yes, there was yeah. a per metre charge on the frontage um, size against the property owners, which later turned into a targeted rate because of the, the elegant complexities of collecting the former. Um, but So I just want to be quite clear. So t talking project specific, um, in the case of street works, the, the surface street works in George Street, you're suggesting a balance of what would be appropriate? I think council should have been through that already. I didn't know there was a, uh, an initial charge for those. I think that's the sort of thing you would be looking at. Okay. But I think and where's the balance, though? Is the majority of it public or is the majority private? So what, 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 what expenditure, what, what's the details of the project? What well, are you doing down there? We've currently got $60 million in the budget for that work. Um, how much of that percentage should be how much of that quantum should be recovered, in your view, from the direct beneficiaries, the property owners? I'd have to have a look at the project, and, and then I can provide. If you give me the details of the project, I can provide a very specific answer. We may well as, do a, that. as a general view, um, you know, our concern is council is just chucking on the general rate when you shouldn't be. Well, but the numbers you threw at us before were either 70-30 or 60-40 or some sort. Again, as a general view, it's indicative of, yeah, uh, of what, other councils, what, uh, what other councils do when which, they're doing the same thing. Which is the public and which is the private is what I'm trying yeah. to... Yeah, which, which is the public. Generally, if it's... Uh, again, it, it depends on... For infrastructure, it, it would be... If it's general access infrastructure, it would be a, a more significant component of general good. And so I would say 60% general good. 60% public good. Yep. All right, thank you. Although I must note that um, Queenstown Lakes have got a wee bit excited there and, uh, and, and have, have essentially said that all of it is isolated to a defined area. And I think that's, that's the, the complexity as well, is that even those geographically based targeted rates are based along some general good. They're just defining the area of general good. Yeah. Well, following on from that, would you be supportive of looking at it a completely different way, and that is a value uplift tax. So you calculate the degree to which the property is increased in value, and you you tax that. It's like a like a capital gains tax. I mean, obviously, there's some um, questions about when you collect that, when the when the value is realised or not. But there is um, um, nationally a bit of a conversation at the moment about it. so. You'd, you, when you mention targeted rates, are you using that generically? That you'd, it's about the beneficiaries contributing, so you'd be open to various ways of collecting that. Yes, yes, definitely. I think, um, and I've got to say, we support where council are going. Uh, sorry, local government New Zealand are going on some of those additional yes. tax because that's the, that is a fundamental concern. Is council have limited tools, yes. and so even a geographically defined area-based targeted rate. Is just a limited way of doing what you're effectively describing as a value add, or essentially a value add tax. Yep. So definitely would support that principle. Right. Yeah. Thank you. No further questions? David, thank you very much for your submission. Um, very stimulating. That's thank you. Off, from the from, um, questions around the table, obviously you struck a, a nerve and uh, very constructively. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Thank you. Yes. All right. Mr. Lamb. No, just up the front there. Welcome, Mr. Lamb. Thank you. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, my submission is from Keith and Daphne Lamb uh, regarding the 10 year plan for 12 Porterfield Street, McAndrew Bay, Dunedin. Get all infrastructure regarding South Dunedin, pipes for sewage, 
drainage and water channeling and curving and cycle lanes up to date before even considering investment into other parts of the city. Then and only then, moderate investment in central city, 35 million, moderate investment in tertiary areas, 20 million, basic bridge if the harbour de development proceeds, 10 million. Thank you. Question, are you happy to take questions, Mr Lamb? Yes, yeah, fine. Questions, councillors? There are none, but can I say that your submission is very clear. We know exactly what you're asking of us, so thank you for that. Right, OK. Appreciate it. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Councillors, that's the... Um, the next, the, the next scheduled submitter is not, uh, has been not struck off, but, hmm? Oh, no, 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 the next, the next scheduled submitter has pulled out, and I haven't seen, well, I haven't seen him, and he's pulled out, so um, we will now break for, we're now bang on time. So we'll break until 10.50, at which point the next submitter is um, coming through. We'll get underway again, councillors. And our uh, first submitter in this session is Ms Tucker, Jan Tucker. Welcome, Jan. Good morning. Welcome. Hello. Um, thank you for uh, listening to my submission, which is going to be completely verbal. Sometimes I think the spoken word is important as the written word. And I want to talk about um, the seawalls down West Harbour. Um, I don't know how many of you have driven down that to Aramoana since the weather event last year and seen the condition of the road. And um, also seen any photos of the flooding that occurred at properties down there, especially at Tainaru, which was pretty dramatic, I can tell you. Um, the council has, um, from the flood relief, has got 250,000 to restore the road, the walls, and to fill behind, back to the condition they were, were in before this weather event last year, or the two weather events. I won't exact, use the exact words that one resident down there used, but he, it, what he implied was it was just like um, pouring $250,000 into the harbour, because with the next weather event that happens down there, all this will go again. 
So what I would like to strongly recommend is funding in the long-term plan for a feasibility study to future-proof and to protect properties, access and safety to the West Harbour Bays, especially those from Hamilton Bay down where the worst, worst of, is really there. Um, and this is a real problem and they're at danger from storm surge and sea level rise. There has been a public meeting promised sometime last year for this year. I would urge that it be sooner than later because let's face it, a quarter of the year has already gone. Um, demographics have certainly changed down that way um, from when years ago it used to be basically cribs or weekenders. Now there is a very large permanent population. The road is used every day. It is the only access. Even by sea, there is no usable wharf for a boat to call in for any evacuations. So I would really urge that in the long-term plan, there is money put aside for the feasibility study to look at how this problem can be alleviated and areas in which it should be raised. Many of the citizens down there look with envy to the peninsula especially when they see, again, large amounts of money being put over there to raise the height of their roads and their sea walls. They do realise, A, that this is indeed um, for the peninsula basically a tourist area. But Aramoana is also attracting a lot of tourists down there and there are buses go down. So please, can some money be put in that long-term plan for a feasibility study and please let the residents of those West Harbour communities see that Council does care. But on a positive note, I would really like to say how great those barn dance crossings are and well done Council because they are excellent and the time given so you can see how much to cross and people are using them. So yeah, that's positive. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Now look, look a question um, <coughs> first of um, Ms Mash. Um, and I know that you have a, a two perspectives on this, but I just want to check. We, we put some money in the budget uh, either a year ago or slightly before, or maybe two years ago for to look at coastal erosion as a result of climate mm. change effects. And I'm wondering whether a that applies to this and whether it's where we are with that, because that seems to me exactly what that funding was put in for. Coastal specialist on. <laughs> no, thank you, because I can't hear you. Hi, sorry. I just lean here, shall I? Uh, Leanne Mash, infrastructure um, responsibilities at the executive level. Mm. Yes, resident of Aramoana. <laughs> Hello, neighbour. Uh, so, yes, I too drive the road every day and I've seen the most recent damage. And we, on a non personal front, we now have a staff member internally at our disposal. Uh, who is a coastal specialist and he started about a month ago and so I will certainly have a look at his work program and see where the West Harbour is sitting on that and then um, I wasn't aware about the commitment to a public meeting uh, that was made previously having just been here since January but again I've, I've written a note on that and I'll um, take that on board and see where that is scheduled and when it shall happen. Thank you, Mr. Thank, thank, thank you, because I did attend a civil defence meeting down there, at which there were about 40 people, and again, they were quite strongly, look what's going to happen down here. So any action would be really appreciated by those residents. Thank yeah. you. Councillors, any other questions? Oh, I'm getting out no. easy today. Jan, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Gallagher. Kia ora John, welcome. Good morning, Dave. Good morning everybody. Uh, well thank you for the opportunity to give uh, some brief comments this morning in my capacity as uh, Chair of the Digital Community Trust. Um, all of you will I'm sure recognise or realise that that was the group that essentially did the work around the Gigatown competition uh, which we subsequently were fortunate enough to win. But Really, my comments this morning are, uh, in part, the experiences that we got, what we gained from that competition, and also the considerable work that's been done by the Digital Trust subsequent to winning that over the last two and a half, nearly three years. 
Those last three years have been a chance for us to better understand the impacts of technology, including the value of the access, our access to the world via the ultra-fast broadband that we all now know we, we have available. But importantly, in the latter stages of the work of the Community of Digital Trust, our strategic conversations and the thinking has moved on to the obvious question, so what's next? And it's in that, and that's one of the reasons um, that we've spent a lot of time and energy uh, talking with people and, and trying to understand how we should best move forward. One of the reasons why Dunedin was so successful in the Gigatown competition was the digital strategy that the DCC, the council, developed some years ago and had the foresight to think about how that might impact on our city and our community, the people in the, all across the, across the town, across the city. And that gave us, to be honest, a great foundation uh, to develop the plan for success, which was one of the key components of, of winning the Gigatown competition. Much of what we set out in that plan has been carried out or is in the process of being carried out. And you'll be aware of some of the things that are very visible, such as hotspots and, and so on, the um, facilities that we put into the library. But what this has created in our minds is a very firm conviction that there are a series of unique opportunities now for Dunedin to position itself very deliberately as a 21st century smart city. And we believe that this should be a fundamental part of any discussion around a 10-year plan for the city, for Dunedin. So what do we mean by a smart city? Essentially, it's all about using technology in its many forms to make services work better, to manage key assets, and to make people safer and, importantly, improve the quality of their life. So developing a smart city is simply not one single project. The smart city has shifted from being an off-the-shelf bundle of tech solutions to a more integrated approach to governing cities. However, what makes a city smart is using those technologies in a user-friendly and democratic way. Now that's a quote from a New Zealander, Dr Jenny MacArthur, who's now doing this work for the City of London. So there is a, there's a lot of work going on globally in terms of how it works and, and what it can deliver to a city. So as a consequence of our thinking, um, discussion across many sectors of the community through the Digital Trust, we've commissioned a report from Martin Jenkins uh, called The Direction Setting for Dunedin as a 21st Century Smart City. And we felt that was one of the most important finishing components of the work that we were asked to carry out under the Trust's uh, direction. In our mind, this uh, the final draft which I've reviewed is an excellent document and it will be uh, inserted into the council system at senior level uh, over the next couple of weeks and eventually will come through uh, in that form to, for all of you to review. And I'd commend it to you because it's been a, a lot of effort, a lot of work's been put into understanding exactly what makes the city tick and what we think can be some of the legacy issues that we can now work on over this next one, two, five, ten years. Um, as I noted, uh, in any discussion about Dunedin and its development over the next 10 years needs to incorporate at the highest level the appropriateness that, that we can, or the opportunities that we can embrace by moving through to becoming a smart city. So from a personal perspective, I'm now very firmly of the view that this represents a pivotal opportunity for the city. None of the other major New Zealand cities have, to my knowledge, taken full advantage of this. For me, embedding this in the 10-year plan, inside the long-term strategy and inside the DCC, senior team uh, and council uh, gives us a unique chance to become not New Zealand's, one of New Zealand's great small cities, but New Zealand's great small smart city. For me, it's as much as, as it is functional, it also needs to be aspirational. We can create a unique blend of innovation, lifestyle and growth for our city over the next decade. We need to understand and embrace innovation and tech so that it also becomes part of brand Dunedin. Dunedin should be known and understood as a city of innovation, as a city that understands what the future looks like, what the 21st century uh, will deliver to us and those opportunities. And I honestly think that um, the chance for us to have the courage of our convictions take innovation on board in its many forms, and this covers startup companies, the growth that we've already seen here. This is just the beginning of what we can achieve. But I think there's a huge chance for us to, to re reset the perception. And so for part of the, the sort of the outcome of this exercise has been a, an aspirational uh, 
sort of understanding. There is a chance for us to reset the need, a chance for us to reset the perception from the rest of New Zealand and from the rest of the world, in fact, that we have a, we have a, a really clever 21st century city that embraces all of the things that are important for our community but looks outwards and says there's, there's a huge amount of opportunities to bring people here. It's a lifestyle choice, but we have to go out and tell people. Thank you, John. That's really quite inspiring, actually. Thank you. Um, questions, councillors? Councillor Staines. Thank you, John. Uh, firstly, I think uh, Mayor Cull and I were uh, part the parties which started the digital strategy work under council quite a few years ago. Um, but my question for you is, do you think that strategy is still relevant, or do we need to review it given the changes that have occurred during the period that that strategy has been in force? Without doubt. You know, I think strategies do have a life. Um, and so, you know, the world has moved on considerably. We have a whole lot more resource in the city now in terms of, you know, for example, the ultra-fast broadband is one part of it. We have a huge number of companies that are developing and, and growing technology, creating employment opportunities and shifting the sort of the population dynamic here. So we have to rethink how the next stage, and I think this is what prompted our conversation within the Digital Community Trust was strategy, whilst it was an outstanding document, it has a limit, you know, it has a life. And so we need to move on. Now, whether we do that as a separate exercise, in terms of the, what we felt was this one of the legacy issues that we could deliver back to the city from, from the Gig City uh, uh, competition, was starting that process. So our, our, if you like, our contribution to that has been the Martin Jenkins report, which we hope will stimulate some conversation. And we've tried very hard to keep it as a, a practical, pragmatic document. It's not a, it's, it's short and to the point, but it picks up all of the key issues that we think need to be embedded in the next strategy. Um, our view is a question of how that then integrates into this plan and how it works in terms of the, of the actual you know, city's operations. So John, in terms of where, like we have a suite of strategies of which the digital strategy actually isn't one. Do you think we should have a, a plan, if you like, for digital, or do you think it's of such consequence that it should actually be part of our economic development strategy? The latter, without a doubt. I think it's absolutely fundamental. It's another piece of infrastructure. I mean, when we set out to do the, the Gig City competition, one of the things that became obvious is that when, they, when electric power became available to all, all of the public, most people didn't know what to do with it. You know, it was a, it, it, it's now a natural, a natural part of your infrastructure. Technology in its myriad of forms is going to have the same effect. So we have to think about how that's going to integrate within the city. And you know, I, I still come back to the view that having looked at, at what's happening around the world and look what um, we've been able to generate here, um, the chance for Dunedin to take a leadership role in this and show the world that we can be innovative. Um, and you know, even Manchester used to, there was a quote there that you know, what Manchester does, the rest of the world follows, and that was from the 1800s. And they're now doing that in terms of a smart city, and they're taking that same attitude, and they are making their mark and, and changing the nature of that city hugely for that reason. We're, we're looking, I think the economic development strategy is due for its mid 10-year uh, term uh, update, um, so we could potentially, uh, if Council agrees, put the digital strategy review into that. Would the Digital Community Trust be interested in being part of that process of developing that, that digital part of the next or the reviewed economic development strategy? Of course. I think you know we've we've got some uh, great experience that's around the table, and we've learned a lot over the three years. And I think we've become more positive and more excited by the opportunities that we can create for the city now. So yes, of course. I mean, the, the digital trust has a purpose at the moment. So that assumption is that we'll continue on in some form. So whichever way it works, of course, we'll do that. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Your Worship. Kia ora, John. Hi. Um, just picking up on that, if if your view is that it's an integral part of infrastructure. Would it be a risk to isolate it within an economic development context rather than having it sit as part of every part of infrastructure and part of arts and culture and part of economic development? Oh, it's a very fair question. Yeah. I think I would answer it in two ways. One of them, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it in terms of driving the economic growth. I, I look at it from how, how can we build 
greater opportunities commercially for the city in whichever form, which will allow us to do so much more in terms of our, you know, all of the other areas that you mentioned. What I'm hopeful is that this evolves into a situation where it becomes a fundamental part of council operations. It could be led and, and driven in the early stages by uh, economic development. Uh, certainly I defer to Sue on the, how, how that might work. But that said, um, I just think it becomes an integrated part of your organisation. And it probably, if I could venture a suggestion, it could almost be one of the senior roles that could evolve into the future that somebody actually continues to, because it will be as important as an infrastructure item as everything else that we've been dealing with for the last 150 years. It's the new piece that we've got to integrate if, as a, an outside perspective. Um, I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, is it something that we will be able, uh, my concern is that when you say it's working its way up over the next weeks and months, that we won't get it in time to consider it as part of this process, which makes no, it difficult to integrate. No. I'm, I'm told that it should be cleared through the senior leadership team and everything within the next couple of weeks, maximum. So that's our, that's our expectation that it's going to come to you, because we recognise the importance of that piece of work in terms of how this conversation should evolve over the next few, week or two. Right. So, yeah. No, it's, it's Before it's, the 23rd of April. John's nodding oh, got you, got you. <laughs> um, and, and my other one is just a, um, and I, it's not, it's, there's a little value in discussing its contents now, but I have a specific question, um, there, and it's somewhat topical. There are a lot of anxieties in the age of smart cities and big data around data and security of, of data and those sorts of things. Is that canvassed or is that something that you would suggest we develop policy around in parallel to how we deal with those issues? I, I, would, I would absolutely do that. I think you know, we shouldn't lose sight of the aspirational piece of this at the moment and understand how it can be a, you know, a huge value add for the city. Those policies, you know, thanks to Facebook and you know, Cambridge Data and a few other things, will evolve quite quickly and we'll understand how they do it. The key for the city, I think, is to understand that there will be a massive amount of data available. How do you process that? How do you make decisions on the back of that? How do you use technology to do that? But in the same breath, I would also say that part of our conversations you know, with uh, uh, economic development and with DCT is broader than this. You know, we, we see a smart city as technology based, of course, but there's a whole lot of other things we can do uniquely in Dunedin to foster innovation. And I guess what it is, is that having lived and worked here for a long time, the notion of a work-life balance, of a lifestyle, of an ability to connect with the world now, which we have, should be a huge advantage to us. You know, and so the aspirational bit is to wrap that up on brand Dunedin and say that's the way we should be selling ourselves to the world. You know, and it all comes back to all of the things you mentioned are all part of building that. It's not just on its own. But it's a whole lifestyle choice. And what I'm trying to understand is how best we produce uh, the right outcomes for the city and how we use these resources to, you know, to build brand in Eden. And it's working, but um, we need to do a lot more. Councillor Newell. Thank you, Worship. And uh, kia ora, John. Hi. Um, just talking about your resetting, and I, I like that because I, I, obviously a lot has been accomplished through the gig city, but um, talking about telling the world about that, do you, do you think it could be time for us to get rid of the, the uh, small in our branding and just replace it with one of the world's great smart cities? I would be hopeful we could get there quite quickly, yes. And I think, um, for me, looking at it from, from my perspective, it's about having the courage of our convictions. If we believe we can do it, I think there's an element of risk in, in everything we do, and I think you know, the risk is here of not doing something rather than doing something. So I think you know, we should have now, having gone through quite a, a long period of resetting you know, the city and getting a lot of things tidied away, here's a chance for us to be a little bit aspirational and have a bit of courage about doing some things like that. Just a personal view, but I think that's something that I would think would be hugely, hugely uh, positive for the city. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Yeah, hi John. And thanks for coming along today. And look, it's been very positive the conversation. I must admit I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I mean I, I we had a we had an engineer here the other day that was making the comment that the Needon is a place he's returned to live and he loves a lot about the Needon, including the fast internet. He said it's or, or high speed internet. He says it's just fantastic. But my question is probably looking back, you know, there was a lot of agitation at different times over the last five years that we haven't done enough, we haven't put enough money in, we haven't been quick enough, we've, we've, we've ballsed it up basically, the, the winning the Gigatown competition and, and you've cheered this right through that time and obviously gone through all the frustrations that go with all the aforementioned faults, but, but would you just have a comment now about how you feel about that, like do you think we've done okay or would you give us a pass or have we... <laughs> um, yes, I would. Um, it was a, a little slow at the beginning. I think the, 
you know, the, the, the huge um, feeling of accomplishment we gained by winning the competition was just the beginning. And I don't think anyone really sat down and said, OK, so if we win, what do we do? So we did have to build out from that. And we did that as, as fast as we were able, and we had to put you know, checks and balances in place. And we all appreciated that you know, we had to create a, a good case for the funding. And um, we did that, and we put everything in place. Um, knowing what I know now, there would have been some things you might have done differently. But you know, at the, the end of the day, the priority was for us, first and foremost, to try and win this thing. But um, yeah, I think we've, we've, we've got a lot, and we've got a lot of momentum. And I think what we've got is not necessarily is, is, is all tangible. It's the intangible. We have now a, a confidence as a city we can do stuff. I mean, I've never seen a, a city respond in this way. I mean, it was remarkable the way the city got in behind this, and that's what got us across the line. We only won it by a nose, you know. So that everything the city did, and so that gave us great confidence to sort of get on and try and get this stuff. Yes, we could have done a lot more, you know. And it's like anything: if you've got a lot of money, you'll find reasons to spend it. We had to be as smart as we could about using the money we were given and recognising where that money came from. But I think we've put some legacy things in place. There are some really good things that the city has now, you know, like the 15 free Wi-Fi spots, like what, you know, the, the hub in the, in, the, in the library. All those things matter, but there's a far, far greater understanding of what this can now do for Dunedin as a city connected to the world. You know, you go to New York, you can, the, the internet speeds in downtown New York leave just are embarrassing when you consider what you can do at the, you know, at the front door of the, of the town hall here. So there's huge things that we just have to be better at telling the world about. So those are the things I think that we're better at now. So, so that leads into my next question. And like I said, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I mean, I, I, I can download the ADT in less than a minute, but it takes me all day to read it. So, but the question, the question is, um, does does the uh, well, are you seeing evidence of those businesses that are getting good generation from that high-speed internet? Like, for me in my daily business, it doesn't actually make a lot of difference whether I've got high speed or just normal, if you know what I mean. So are we seeing evidence of that being good for our city? Yep. Without a doubt. Uh, and I mean, it, it, it takes away any other issues that people might have about coming or choosing to come and live in the city here. And we're actually getting a whole lot of our people that are at the university here or, or live and breathe here. They, are, they stay because they now can do what they want to do and they don't have to go somewhere else to, to do it. So the speed and the quality and, the, and effectively the price, because we shouldn't overlook the fact that one of the slump, somewhat intangible benefits was the fact that for three years Chorus gave us a significantly discounted rate to get access to that. So that saved the, you know, everybody who used that sort of resource. Five million? No, five years. Five and a half, yeah. So yeah, so you know, it, it, in terms of payback for the 500,000, you know, I would, I, in, in my business, that's a very good return. So I'm very pleased with that. You know, but I think more importantly, it's about the understanding that we as a community now have about those opportunities and how we can engage with the world. And that's a confidence thing. And you, you know, and I know a lot of the tech companies we deal with and a lot of the startups that are out there now. One of the reasons is exactly the community and the, and the sort of the, 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 the culture that's emerging in Dunedin. That matters. I'd, I'd like to just address that um, question too, because I'm, I was very conscious of the criticisms about what we weren't doing at the time. <coughs> I tend to be more outcome focused, mm. and the outcomes are proving to be extremely positive. In the last few weeks, the Chief Executive and I met with an organisation who are considering bringing 300 jobs to this city. And what they told us right up front was the edge over other cities that you have is your is your gig capacity. End of story. So that's the outcome, uh, and it's all very fine for people to criticise what we were and weren't doing at the time. These are the results. So. Councillor O'Malley. Thanks for your presentation, John. And I, I, I would actually say that when it comes to technology, infrastructure spends are probably the most important and biggest return on your dollar. Um, more important than mentoring and, and grants and other such things, because usually the people coming in don't need that, but mm. they do need the infrastructure. My question is actually about the Martin Jenkins report. Is is that going to be a strategy, and does it uh, is it also going to be an implementation document? Will it have suggestions on how we implement the next stage? Yep. Yeah. I mean, we've tried to, without presuming what the decisions might be, we've tried to give some guidance about what we think are the important components. So we've actually tried to give some practical um, outcomes to that. And I think I'd make the point that the mandate for Martin Jenkins was to go out and speak to the community. This is not a report that has been driven solely out of the Digital <coughs> Community Trust. Mm. It's been instigated by us, but 
it was important that they went out and they spoke to the community right across the board. So as much as we can get a broad-based set of feedback, that's what we've done and that's what we hope we can present to you to give you a good sense of what the opportunity is. So a good starting point for us as we go back and look at this again. Great. Exactly. Next. Yep. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, John, uh, for your leadership in this area and for your submission. I want to give some context to my question. Um, because we certainly heard from a submitter yesterday about the attraction to the city for particular young professionals around Gig City and so forth. Um, but you touched on the lack of understanding possibly from sectors of the community in some of the gaps, and I absolutely appreciate that it's not necessarily part of, um, it's a sort of a difference between the expectation and the reality. Uh, so I think of, if I think of our, one of our premium um, tourist attractions, the Albatross Colony, wasn't part of the central city of the gig city, but you know, serious issues uh, with internet connection. Um, so my question is around, uh, and this may come up in the Martin Jenkins report, but I wonder if you could speak to it, obstacles to our becoming a smart city uh, that council has influence over. I think... Um if I start from the top of the pyramid and work down, I think the obstacle is not appreciating the importance of, of the pivot towards being, um, I mean, the smart city conjures up a whole bunch of different ideas in people's minds, but I think one of the obstacles is not recognising that here in my opinion, lies a great opportunity for us to reset the, you know, the direction of the city. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a panacea to everything we've done, but I mean, it simply positions us where we need to be, which is hopefully at the front of the, the line rather than uh, somewhere down the back. And we have every part of the resource that we need to put together a, you know, a, a very attractive city and a very attractive lifestyle. So I think the, the obstacles are more about perception, um, you know, and, and saying, well, look, as I said before, you know, Brandon Eden is, is, is always a debate. But I mean, one of the things you can do here is you can position the city around all of our um, known you know, arts and culture, education, health and everything else, and you integrate it through. So for, for, to my way of thinking, the best thing we can do is to really spend some time understanding how it all works, but then thinking about how it applies to what Dunedin needs to be in five and ten years' time. That's the opportunity. That's where the courage bit comes in. But I still think... So if you go out and you look and you look at... Um, what the world sees us as. That's, the, to, to me, is what we need to understand. And I always say to people, you know, so what does success look like? What does success look like for this city in five and ten years' time? If we don't do that part of it right, the rest of it becomes redundant, in my opinion. Councillor Wiley. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, many of my questions have actually already been answered. Um, but, John, when when you look at this long-term plan, and this is the key, is what we're trying to see for the city for the next 10 years. One thing that I sort of see with the work that Digital Community Trust have done and with the Gig City Win, is we're starting to really make inroads across all segments of the community, the young, the old, the wealthy, the mm -hmm. poor, you know. Is this one of those areas where we really do have an ability to cover the whole community in that sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, a, a smart city is just simply looking at ways to use technology to make lifestyles better. Um, Big city. There we go. <laughs> 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 dinosaurs uh, in action. <laughs> uh, no, I suspect he might have just been hacked, so we don't know. What to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, look, I think one of the things I see from, the, uh, from, from, a, from a bigger perspective is the city has got everything it needs, but it has the ability to communicate and, and, and collaborate. You know, one of the words that we need to think about in this area is collaboration between all of those areas in the community. And we all know from the work we've done in, in, you know, within the gig city, every time you look at an area, there's an opportunity uh, in terms of making you know, technology make whatever work better. In answer to you know, the, the, the Albatross colony, we did look at it. We tried very hard, but there's simply the cost of getting the fibre from where we were out to you. Um, so we'll find a technology solution, and there'll be a way in which that can work at some stage. And that's the thing I think it is. It, it, it reflects its part of every part of our community, from our retired people, you know, right through to the kids, and some of the initiatives that we funded through the money that we won on the competition, and some of the work that's being done for our young people and the you know, young kids. It's extraordinary what they're doing. 
but there's the same end. What's happening at the at the retired end of the community is just as exciting and just as important. So the, the two key points you you've already covered, and I just want to reaffirm in my mind, is one is that we have to really invest in telling the story, and two really have the digital footprint across council. Yes and yes. Yep. John, thank you very much for that submission and for its positivity and um, inspiration. Thank you. My pleasure. And we'll look forward to that, um, that report. That thank you. And thank you all for your questions and your support over the last few years too. We've all appreciated that. Thank you. Cheers. Right. Denise Ross. Kia ora, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me, public speaking is not my forte. I come well, here. that's all right. That's why we've got the microphone there for the help. <laughs> <laughs> I come here as a parent and a grandparent and a resident of Dunedin City. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Ten years ago I got very excited to hear Mosgill had got a group together to look at a new city port based in Mosgill and it started the submission process. Water safety in New Zealand is a growing problem and I feel Dunedin has a great opportunity to help promote this with the addition of a new port, Mosgill. You may say children are getting lessons in Dunedin schools, but this only scratches the surface of making our children confident in the water. This is where the DCC has an opportunity as part of an active city to promote water safety, to ensure social wellbeing and safety of our young children and grandchildren. Many families do not have transportation or finances available to get children to Moana Pool. But with a new pool at Mosgill, this will give families a chance to take their children to the pool as a family. By spending time together in the pool, they can give their children a chance to gain confidence and allow them to test their abilities in the water, which in turn may ensure they do not get themselves into difficult situations in rivers and beaches. With the current pool at Mosgill, there's not enough play area for children, with only a small paddling pool. We are missing bringing families together and making the pool environment fun, even with swimming lessons, we need to encourage families into the pool for fun as well as great social development and confidence. The Tauri Swimming Club do a great job of teaching young swimmers and is a more affordable way for families to get children into lessons. But again, the small pool means waiting lists for families. As a past swimming coach, it's frustrating when you see improvement within your children for the pool to shut for two terms and know that you have to start again the following terms. Over the last 10 years, I've watched from afar and admired the patience of the founding members of the committee as they negotiated their way through meeting after meeting with DCC. But I'm feeling left puzzled over where the DCC stands in regards to the new poll. I'm puzzled for the DCC to replace the existing poll with like for like, it would cost 10 million. But the figures that have been talked about are that the DCC would only put in 6.4 million, less than it would cost to build the same poll therefore leaving the community to raise 7.5 million. I ask, is this fair? I have not heard other organisations that have had to raise more than the council puts in. Should the DCC not be working on putting in the cost to replace the pool and letting the community raise the funds to put in the additional costs? I can see the DCC as an active city, promoting cycleways and safety for families, which is great for our city. I just hope that the same consideration will be given to the Mosgill Pool by ensuring there is more water space for families, by increasing space at the Mosgill Pool and allowing more access for families to have fun in the pool and gaining more water safety. I hope that you can see the strong support Mosgill and the wider community has for the new pool facility and are close to achieving their first million. It has made me very proud to be part of a town where all sorts of organisations, societies, clubs and general public have got involved in the fundraising without having to wait on the trust to lead them. It shows a great belief in what the community has. But for this to continue, there needs to be a firm and clear commitment from the DCC. I do feel that after 10 years of lobbying for a new poll, it's time the DCC steps up and sets their level of commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're happy to take some questions? Yes. Mm. Councillor Staines. Thanks, Denise. Uh, you mentioned the cost of replacing the Mosgill pool mm -hmm. with a more or less like for like. Yes. You, you know, undoubtedly you'd want to make it operate 365 days of the year instead of just Correct. the short period it does now. Mm -hmm. 
Would you think it would be fair for the community only to have to cover the difference in cost between a almost like for like, but with some improvements that need to be done anyway, a, and a full aquatic facility that's proposed. Are you talking about a community being just the Mosgill community? Or no, are you well, talking about the city the, of Dunedin? The wider community that would gain easier access mm -hmm. than they have to get to Moana. So I don't know how you work that out, but if you said Moana's closer to where you live, you go, you you would be not getting an advantage, but if the new pool was closer to where you live than Moana, then you would be getting a better advantage. So that's that probably the likely catchment area. I feel Dunedin is a small enough city that people will travel. I have tried travelling to the Moana pool myself to Lanesman, but I've been locked out because I can't get parking after five o'clock, I can't get space in lanes. Due to work commitments, I can't get there during the day, so I'm kind of locked out from the pool. The only time I can get there in the weekends. I feel that people will travel to the pools from wherever they are. There will be a great catchment that will come in from South Dunedin, they'll come in from town, they'll make a day out into the pool. So I feel everyone is going to benefit. So I, how finance-wise, that is over to you. It's not my area of expertise. But I feel that for water safety numbers in Dunedin, with the water and beaches around us, we need to be proactive. And having two pools open 365 days a year is what we need for our children. Thank you. Further questions? The run on. I think it can be assured that there, there is a lot of work being done uh, yes. and very recently and some positive uh, proposals will be brought to council shortly. So. Lovely. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. S uh, Leslie Smith. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. So thank you for this opportunity to speak this morning. Um, do I, can I assume that everyone has a copy of our submission? Yes. So within five minutes, I thought I would just focus on the first item of the education program. I'm here representing the Friends of Dunedin Botanic Garden. And let me just say, first of all, that I'm new to both Dunedin and the Botanic Gardens. So I'm sure you're all far more familiar with the gardens than I am. So no curly questions, please. But, um, and I'm sure you're all aware that it's also the oldest botanic gardens in New Zealand, celebrating 150 years in 2013. Um, and I'm also, you're more recently, or you'd be aware that um, the gardens have recently celebrated uh, the retention of its six-star status of a, a garden of national significance. And I believe you all had invitations to attend that. I hope you did take the gardens up on that and congratulate them on their achievement. Um, and of course, another big uh, celebration for the gardens was the, uh, the pulling power of a single flower. 10,000 people came to visit that flower over the course of a, a single weekend. Amazing, and even still now, it continues to get press in the, today's ODT. Um, but despite the um, publicity success of, of a single showy big flower, the plant conservation circles have, have come up with a term called plant blindness. Um, currently, we face uh, the inability to see or notice the plants in our environment the inability to recognize the importance of plants in the biosphere and in human affairs, the misguided anthropocentric ranking of plants as inferior to animals and thus as an unworthy consideration. Most people in developed nations tend to see plants as merely a green, blurry backdrop for the animals and human-made objects that populate the visual field. This is where botanic gardens come in. Botanic gardens are invaluable in raising awareness of plant conservation issues and the importance of species diversity. They kindle an interest in plants as well as potentially teaching children where food comes from. 
or fostering a love of nature and the natural environment. Our built environment is regularly influenced by nature and flowers have been inspiring creative minds for centuries. It can be seen in art and architecture around the world. So what we're seeking is a dedicated full-time curriculum-based teacher that would enable the garden to provide a rich, hands-on sensory learning experience for thousands of local students. Approximately three and a half thousand are within walking distance. An education program will inspire curiosity and fascination and encourage scientific inquiry in the worlds, about the worlds of plants. Dunedin Botanic Garden is in an ideal environment to learn about plant identification and increase awareness and appreciation of plants and why our lives depend on them. So unlike the, ga the gallery um, has managed to get $2 million for, to extend its existing collection, or Otago Museum looking for 1.9 million, we're m merely looking for um, salary for a couple of education officers. Uh, 120,000 would be very nice. Um, and that's about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are, we, are you happy to take some questions? I'll, tr I'll try and answer some questions, yep. yeah. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Kia ora, Leslie. Um, okay. The request is for teaching staff or a resource to cover teaching staff costs, um, noting that the skills required to develop a curriculum aren't always the same skills as teaching one. So do the re does the program already exist? There is no education role in the gardens at the moment. Oh, that's the not, sorry, that's not my question. My All question right, is, do, is there, a, is there a, are you looking to resuscitate an existing but dormant program or would we need to develop something? Absolutely, from scratch. The last time there was an educator in the gardens was 2008. It was an <coughs> LEOTC funding, which is, I'm sure you all know is contestable and they, yeah. they didn't keep it. So that being the case, um, what would, if we were to hire two staff to work there, what would they be teaching? Crikey. <laughs> the plant world and, and why we depend on plants. Okay. They're, you know, they're, like I say, the New World supermarket, they've cashed in on the role of, of catching the, the next generation of botanists and conservations. That very successful little garden scheme that they had, hugely successful. Would you be, I'll ask it in a different way maybe, would you be equally supportive um, of us allocating resource to developing a program in the first instance. Uh, and the, we and take the anything right now. There is nothing. Okay. So anything sure. is good news. Thank you. Yep. Further questions, councillors? There are none. Thank you very Thank much you for very your much. submission. Thank you. Bringing it to our attention. Mr. Kinley. Kia ora, welcome. Uh, thank you and good morning. It's actually been a few now, years. Now, if you, what, you, if you just tip, put, put that one on and that one off. That's it. Try that. That's great. Thank Modern you. Modern technology. Um, I'll start again. Thank you. It's been a few years uh, since I've spoken to council. I think it's about four actually. So, so firstly, thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'd actually like to start by turning around a little bit and thanking the DCC for the contribution that they make to sport and recreation. Um, the Targa Rugby Football Union in particular has a well-established and strong relationship with council staff and are very appreciative of the support provided for community rugby. Uh, we, we understand at times it can be challenging, very challenging, especially with the winter sport of rugby and following this week's weather, for example, to maintain the balance between participation and grounds, uh, sports grounds usage and allocation. However, I know that the union staff work very closely with your park and recs team, ensuring the best outcomes where possible can be achieved for both the DCC and Community Rugby, so again, thank you. I also thought it was timely to mention one area of focus for us this year. Um, you may or may not be aware of the survey we undertook last year with Metropolitan Rugby players. We had over 400 respondents um, across a number of grades, and the key findings we found were that players at all levels of rugby, no matter which age grade 
want rugby to be fun and they want to socialise with their friends and family. Um, overall, the length of the season for most competitions is favourable. The majority of players still see Saturday as the preferred day to play their game, regardless of the level of competition. Work and study commitments are still the major issue that all sports are facing. But more importantly, or most importantly to us, was that the club environment and experience is the key influencer to participation, regardless of what level they play. So on that point, um, the union plans to continue working very closely with all metropolitan rugby clubs to assist their development and also to spread best, best practice as there are some excellent, excellent examples of club development occurring across the city at the moment, which, which is great. Um, the pleasing point on that, though, is that clubs are willing and wanting to share their experiences to assist rugby as a whole get stronger. So I just thought it was important to highlight that. Um, Logan Park, and I know that some of my other sporting counterparts have been in. Um, look, we're aware and acknowledge that there's a number of competing priorities the Council face when looking at the 10-year plan, and that Parks and Recreation Strategy is, is one of eight council strategies that all focus on achieving community outcomes that work towards achieving the vision of Dunedin as one of the world's great small cities. The RFU has been part of a council-led process that has involved approximately 42 user groups that looked in depth at the future use and how to maximise use of the areas contained in and around Logan Park. Um, there's been considerable time spent and consultation undertaken to date, and while acknowledging the priorities outline of the 10-year plan, there if you would ask that there at least be a minimum a reference to the importance Logan Park plays in the future of sport and recreation to the city included. With the developments to Logan Park occurring now and commencing later this year, it's actually very important that a clear plan for maximising the park for all user groups, not just sports groups but our day-to-day -day recreation users which are mostly students, um, is developed and implemented. Also, I'd like to take this chance to highlight the proposed increase of 4% to ground user fees. As I mentioned before, I understand it's a challenge for Council balancing the expectations of users with the costs associated with maintaining and servicing sports grounds. However, I need to advocate for our clubs as the proposed increase will put more financial pressure onto them as ultimately the increase will have to be passed on. My concern is that the only way clubs would able to be able to meet this pressure is by increasing the cost to individuals to play not just rugby but all sports. And when looking at the high number of juniors involved in rugby and understanding the benefits that sport provides, not just to physical but to social and personal development, I wouldn't, we wouldn't like to see the cost of participating becoming a barrier. I have no doubt that our success as a province and a country comes from our high participation um, numbers at junior sport level. The RFU supports our clubs by applying for trust funding to support and offset the cost of ground user fees, as it is important to the union to maximise participation and reduce the cost where possible. The challenge that you'll all be well aware of, and I'll use a, an analogy, is that the well that everyone goes to for trust funding has less in it, but there's more and more people going to the well for support. Um, as an example, this week we received approximately one quarter of the amount requested in an application to support our clubs with ground user fees. Um, in summary, the RFU understands that Council has a number of priorities in the next 10 years and that sport and recreation is one part of a jigsaw puzzle that makes the need in a great city to live in. However, it is important that sport and recreation is included as one of the priorities. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are you happy to take questions? Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Questions, councillors? Councillor O'Malley. Um, I do have to preface this question with association with Logan Park High School and University Football Club. Um, when you look at the Logan Park redevelopment, and you can see that, that there isn't really funding in the 10-year plan, but there has been a lot of work done on the master plan. Yes. Um, would you like to see the master plan at least kept forward as a reference document so that as we go forward, we're at least sticking to a... Absolutely, and I, I had a meeting yesterday with, with a number, of, a couple of other sports, and, and again, I understand the priorities around funding, but I, I wouldn't like to see that, that work and, and then the concept drawings and all the plan, plans that have gone to date, and there's been a, a lot of work gone into that to, to be... To be, um, I mean, to get 40, and, and look, I applaud the council to get 42 to 45 user groups together in the one room at one time, is, is a big task as it is, and to get everyone actually agreeing on a concept and, and a, an overall strategy going forward, I think is really important. That that's not lost. That's because there are component parts to it. So if we can keep the plan in place, we might be able to see different parts of it at times. Yep, absolutely. Any other questions, Councillor Wiley? Um, thank you. Um, Richard, when you look at um, the usage by rugby on sports fields and then you look at football and all the other sports, 
Do you think at times we have too many sports fields and we should focus more on having quality fields and investing in getting better surfaces in those fields versus of trying to maintain all the fields? Very good question. Um, probably last year if I was here I would have said yes, but then looking at when our players want to play, um, and I would imagine if other sports did the same sort of survey work, um, they would probably, most sports would say, look, Saturday and Sunday is our, our key days. So if you look at the numbers at, across all sports that require grass surfaces, um, I suppose the challenge you have is that if you minimise the number of fields and, and put more resource into those, you would need to then have access during the week, which would then would be an, an increase in lighting or whatever that may be to, to access those. Um, I think also we have, we have a, an advantage that a lot of cities don't have. A lot of our sports fields are, are quite sand-based, so they, do, they are available more often. And in fact, if, if anyone did a straw poll around the, around the country, some cities have a higher frequency of cancel, cancellations for junior sport than we do. So I think to have that, that ability to be able to shift games around some of our, our more um, accessible fields that are, that are sand-based, i.e. out Kettle Park at different places, is probably a benefit. Um, yeah, I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't advocate for, for reducing the number of fields at, at this stage. OK. Mm. Um, and my follow-up question is, is there a, and I'm, I saw, for example, the Sevens in Vancouver playing on an artificial pitch, um, is there more, say, potential with an artificial surface for especially junior rugby um, in that sense? Very good. We discussed artificial pitch, pitches yesterday. Actually, I was talking to Roger Clark, and still think there's a lot of work for rugby to be junior rugby. Agreed. Um, for senior rugby, with the impact, um, I, I understand that some of the artificial pitches further north that had had rugby on them historically have actually been taken out. Um, so I do think there's still some work to, to go in making artificial pitches for senior rugby probably. Um, appropriate for the impacts, but junior rugby, absolutely, and, and already discussions with, with Football South around the, the, the planned turfs for Logan Park, we do see some, some absolute synergies and dual use there. Okay, and also, um, where is women's rugby going, the growth of it, um, development of it? Um, very good question, and in fact I can actually uh, announce, I suppose, it's, it's, I've let the board know that we're, we're advertising at the moment for a participation officer for women's rugby, um, it'll be 30 hours a week for the rest of the year. But we've also just received sign-off uh, from New Zealand Rugby to implement a women's academy, which I, um, we will be starting in the next three to four weeks with 10 to 12 identified young women. So we, we're lifting that next level through. And um, obviously that leads through to our representative, two representative women's teams as well. So there's, there's actually a really good focus nationally and, and locally happening now on women's game, which is good. Councillor Newell. Thank you, Richard. Kia ora. Um, just a couple of things. You mentioned the, um, the, the fact that the culture at the clubs was a huge driver for the resurgence in the sport, um, and I've noticed that too. I mean, what, what do you put that down to? What, what's changed? Well, there's a number of things. I think it boils down to the key people, the key people involved in the clubs, and, and I can use lots of different examples, but some clubs have done very well in, in recruiting a new generation of volunteers coming through. And I think all sports, and I've been involved, as a lot of people know, in a number of different sports over the years, and it's the same volunteers that have been there for 20, 30 years. Some clubs have actually done a very, very good job in recruiting new people to take on responsibilities. I also think that, that the role of a volunteer has been, in the clubs that have been successful, they've actually allocated roles and responsibilities clearly across people, rather than just saying, oh, you're a volunteer and you've got this great big job description. It's actually having a lot of people doing little parts. And, and look, the Green Island Club is a great example. Tyree Club, um, the Awaka Club, which had their 125th last, last weekend. There's some really, really good stuff starting to happen in that club space. The other thing is, um, I know in uh, other parts of the country, um, there's a big fall off um, once uh, they, they hit secondary school. Um, but some other um, parts of the country, for example, um, play their, their rugby, uh, school rugby on a Wednesday and still play competition club on, on the Saturday. Is, there, is that something that we could consider here? Yes, it is. And when I was on the uh, management group of the Otago Secondary School Sports Association, there was a lot of work done, particularly looking at the Canterbury model, around um, school sport on Wednesday, um, club-based sport on a Saturday. And, and there's a few challenges around the geographical layout of, of where we are, and also the transition of Wednesday sport to Saturday. There was a, a feeling that a lot of the children that were leaving school at 2 o'clock or wherever on a Wednesday were actually going home and not playing sport. 
Um, so secondary school <laughs> support is still, still very important. But the thing I would add is, is what, we see in, what we see happening a lot. And, and for example, the, the Unipol competition last year that plays on Logan Park increased by 250 players. Now, the people that all play in that competition still classify themselves as rugby players. I'm old school. I train Tuesday, train Thursday, play Saturday. Mm. But we've, we've all sport have got to understand that there are a group of people, young people coming through who still want to be engaged in sport, still classify themselves as participants in the game, but it's, it's more of it. And I shouldn't say it's social because when they play on a Saturday, they still want to play to win. But they just haven't got that same time and or commitment to training. So for sports, the challenge I issue to all sports is, is to maximise the competition pathway whilst not forgetting about the participation pathway. Because players will gravitate backwards and forwards across both. So that's sort of part of that high school environment as well. Thank you. Councillor Steadman. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, in line with um, Councillor Newell's um, comments, um, would it, I, from my own experience with my young lad, he's now at high school, a lot of his team have actually not playing now. They've gone to certain schools in Dunedin and, and they're not playing rugby. They're lost to the game. They're playing these things. Um, so if there was a... They would still be playing if there was actually still a club. They might not be the big strong player now that's been picked by certain schools, but they are actually also our future um, uh, coaches, managers, and all that sort of thing. So I just wonder if the Otago Union needs to actually seriously look at getting back to the club model and getting them right through to the Colts, taking the pressure off the school. They can still play their first 15, second 15, um, but getting those kids that are lost to it, then we can get them the more of the culture happening in the club, more participants, and therefore there's not so much financial stress on the club that are worried about the rates that they're um, trying to pay. Would that be fair or...? Absolutely agree. Um, at the moment, a piece of work that's been undertaken by New Zealand Rugby is actually looking at um, secondary school rugby right throughout the country, and it's actually been highlighted as one of the key priorities and strategies for New Zealand Rugby going forward. We've had, locally, we've had some, some very good discussions with the Secondary School Rugby Council, and while it will take a little while to, to effect any change, I, I agree with you. And we've been talking to schools around, it's very important for schools that they maintain their, their top teams going through. So maybe it's you know, an under 14, an under 15, and a first 15, but the rest of those players are released to, to stay in their clubs or, or a combined team or however that may look, because I agree. Otherwise, we're going to continually to lose. And that's not just rugby, that's all sports. It is, I understand cricket as well. So how do we get to heaven faster then? I think there needs to be a lead nationally, um, and once there's some direction and some, I suppose, some the New Zealand Rugby Rugby Council and New Zealand Rugby need to set some quite clear guidelines for the for how secondary school rugby looks throughout the country, and then it's up to the the individual provinces and and schools to implement that. No more. Thank you, Richard. Really appreciate your submission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Westwood. Yeah, I see that. Sir Alan Mark. Oh, thank you. Kia ora. Welcome, Sir Alan. Thank you for the opportunity of uh, speaking to my submission on the city media plan. I'd just like to point out I've had a lifetime in Dunedin, uh, involved largely with the university and research work in the South Island High Country, looking at sustainable management and protecting water production, which has relevance to the city. Um, I've been involved with a number of organisations, um, a catchment board, to, uh, four terms on that, looking at high country issues again, uh, the Otago Conservation Board for 11 years, Forest and Bird Protection Society since the mid-70s, looking at uh, restoration of the town belt and uh, Aral Moana, uh, the boardwalk in Aral Moana. And uh, latterly, I've been involved with um, the Wise Response Organisation, which has made presentations to central and local government, uh, including organising a uh, public meeting in Dunedin in late January, 
on climate change issues from a central and local government perspective and you as Mayor will address that issue on behalf of, central, of local government. And uh, so I've been involved in, as I said, a number of issues over and above my academic role. Um, I compliment the city on its vision uh, and I assume I can take my written submission as read. Um, although I would like to comment on the issue of the bridge, where I took the option of the $10 million basic bridge, but I since then have seen a quote of $1.2 million for construction of this bridge from Edifice Contract, uh, which was going to be available, constructed between March no, and no, August no, of this year. I think we need to clarify. That's a bridge. That's a, that's a different bridge. A different bridge. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, so, um, I am concerned as a retired person with a number of retired people in Dunedin that the, I believe the cost of this issue is um, proposal is beyond many of our ratepayers, those in low income and those with um, in retirement. And uh, it seems to me that we have to look slightly, aim slightly lower in terms of our prospects here. Um, I applaud the acknowledgement of the need to address climate change and commend the city on its action to date and assume that it will continue with improving the city's resilience against this serious threatening issue in the near and long term future. I support the proposal for the upgrading of, I'm speaking to my supplementary submission now, support the proposal of upgrading of street light with using the LED lights with the most um, appropriate advice that the government, sorry, that city has received on this issue. Um, I'm concerned with the um, handling of the replacement of power poles from the, the city's business parties, uh, net energy, and the cost overruns there. I notice also several of the city streets has ceiling lifting, and I just wonder the standard of ceiling. I talk particularly on Bell McEwen Road, which I use every day, part of Helensborough Road, uh, Three Mile Hill. I think the standard of um, ceiling and some of the highways, city roads leave something to be desired in terms of their longevity. As a, I'm concerned with the annual parking fee proposed of $33 for well, retirees. Can, can, I, can I just let you know that that was mistakenly included and it, it's been taken out. Mistakenly included. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, as they said, the annual parking fee. Um, so, um, as I said, I look forward to the implementation of this 10-year plan but I do believe that the cost are beyond many of the city's ratepayers, and particularly those of low income and uh, retirees. Uh, and I notice um, applaud Naitahu's efforts to collaborate with the city on some major investments. I think that's to be applauded. Uh, and uh, I will be interested in the implementation of this plan uh, as it uh, progresses. That's all I have to say, unless there's questions on my um, written submission. Question, yeah, questions, Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan. I have a question that I've asked a number of people, um, and it's around the um, how well known the rates rebate scheme is that we administer for internal affairs. Among the people that you um, speak with, uh, those on fixed and low income uh, that you referred to, how well known is that scheme? I'm not too sure the proposal is well known amongst those people. I notice Grey Power have spoken strongly in support of those people, but... Um, it's, in, it's in place, it's not a proposal, it's been in place for a time. Right. So uh, would you say that people amongst those you speak with would be aware of it? People I associate with probably could afford it, 
although I must admit the rates, the increase in rates are above the inflationary rate and the rate of increased income of most property, uh, most wage earners, salary earners. And uh, I mean, I noticed the regional council is planning a 19% increase in their rates. Um, seems to me local authorities must try to um, modify their aspirations to be consistent with the situation that prevails. And the situation that prevails, as I see it, in terms of income uh, is considerably less than what the city is aspiring to do with the increased rates they're proposing. I myself could probably afford it, but I'm speaking here for many who I know would have great difficulty in, in affording it. And I, I think I, it, I owe it to those people to speak on their behalf, and I'm pleased to see Grey Power has already done so. Councillor Wilson. Um, it's always a chicken and an egg when you're looking at trying to um, help development and assist development and understanding um, who, who has to put the first foot in the door, so to speak, with the money. Now, we've got a placeholder of 20 million for the bridge, maybe it'll be 10 million, and um, depending on what people support. But I suppose you've suggested in your written submission about getting help from government through their fund. Regional Development. Reg yeah, Regional Development Fund. Sure. I'm wondering, but what I, I'm not clear on is, would you support the $20 million bridge if we say, for example, got $10 million from the government for that sort of opening up that land? Or would it be that you'd support a $10 million bridge only even if we were sure that all the other development would happen? I'm, I'm, I, I, yeah, I notice the Minister of Regional Development has shown an interest in the, the hotel building on the waterfront. Um, and I applaud that and I hope that he can come through with some financial assistance on that proposal. I didn't see any comment on the bridge, and I would have thought the bridge he would see as a basic structure and something which the city could probably pick up on its own accord. But I look forward to central government's financial assistance to the waterfront development that's been proposed. I, I suppose putting it another way, if we were to put in a sum into our budget, what conditions would you like us to see being put on that. I mean, no one I think wants to build a bridge to nowhere, as some people have suggested, and I don't think that's anyone's intention. What conditions would you like us to ensure happens before we do that sort of development? I think the bridge is a basic structure, okay. providing access across the railway. And to me, uh, a basic structure is all that's required there. Uh, development beyond that is a different issue and uh, will be relatively expensive, both for developers and for the city. And that's where I see some opportunity for some aspirations really being invested in by city and other developers. But the bridge, to me, is a basic structure. And if it can be built for $10 million, then I think that's adequate. I don't see another $10 million being justified to uh, make the bridge something special. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> true, true. Well, good afternoon to the Chair, elected councillors, Sue Bidwell, DCC staff, and members of the press and public. May I introduce myself? My name is Nigel Westbrook, and I am a super. I repeat, superannuant, and I am fast sliding down the hill towards 100. 
Please may I be excused for reading this submission, but I acknowledge I'm a little nervous and I don't want to miss anything important out in this communication. I want to cover micro and macro, communication and cycleways. Recently I attended a South Dunedin community hui. We all know that South Dunedin is at the apex of the peninsula and Green Island suburbs that has within its boundaries nearly 20% of the total city population. For me, this raises a number of significant issues. Back to the hui. I applaud the presence and positive contribution of the enthusiastic, hard-working council employees. Most notably, my thanks go to two elected councillors, Andrew Wiley and Rachel Elder, whom both made significant contributions. I recognise the presence of many dedicated, waged and salaried NGO and community workers and religious representatives. The point is an overabundance of professional community helpers, some dependent on the public purse, results in muted, I repeat the word muted, constructive criticism which is essential to hold democracy, democratically elected city councillors accountable for their leadership and performance with brickbats and bouquets. Obviously absent was the voice of salt of the earth everyday South Dunedin residents that received help from people attending the hui. Absent were many educators, sports clubs, service organisations and hobby groups. Were the, was the Otago Regional Authority and Harbour Board representatives invited? South City is on the apex of the peninsula and Green Island. On a micro level, we need to ask the question, how much money was Mr allocated? Westwood, could I just ask, um, to, for clarity so we understand, which meeting, can you repeat which meeting you're talking about? So uh, the Hui uh, Thursday week back uh, in South Dunedin at the Blind Foundation. It was a community Hui which the councillors attended, which was really good, and the council contributed uh, a little bit towards that. Um, so that's a meeting that's run by our community development team, and basically they invite a representative from, so they send out a wide invitation to any kind of um, not-for-profit or any community organisation yeah. that feels like they have a lot of people that are part of their group that live or have an interest in South Dunedin. They send out a pretty wide invitation. They say, send it to whoever you like, and whoever turns up, turns up. Tends to be a different group of people turn up every time, but the general reason is let us tell you what's going on, let us update you about South Dunedin, and please tell as many as people as possible after you've met with us. So it's to try and get good communication. So, yeah, so... Beautiful words, good communication, and I'd like to come back to that, because communication is at the heart of what I'm saying here. Um, I, I, I mean, I support the hui, it was brilliant. Um, on a micro level, we need to ask the question, how much money was allocated in a communication budget for these absentee groups? That's my question. On a macro level, I ask this forum, in the 10-year plan on the table, does a communication people strategy or plan and budget <coughs> exist in this 10-year plan, or is it like the micro hui and absent? Maybe it is so insignificant it is not even in the small print. I'm only a superannuant, so maybe I missed something, or maybe just maybe it is buried in other figures because it is so small. Is the only Dunedin City Council presence in Dunedin South a pop-up hub? Does the plan provide 20% of the budget for 20% of the city, southern city environ? Can 20% of council employees work out of a pop-up hub? Yes, it does sound ridiculous, doesn't it? But do South City residents miss the boat? They have no community board. The 10-year plan is an excellent document and I applaud it. However, I simply ask the question for the constituency I live in, is this a 10-year pop-up budget like previous plans proffering continuation of a pop-up lollipop to 20,000 costly, sorry, 20,000 southern Dunedinites? South Dunedin with some of the, has some of the busiest roads and the only pack and, Dunedin pack and save, super warehouse, Bunnings and Mitre 10. They all have highly engineered, costly road transport byways. 
Thus, the motor car combined with a historic council planning error has forced parents to stop encouraging children to cycle in the southern Dunedin area with the highest concentration of residents in the smallest physical space. It only requires two or three kilometres of safe cycleway for our children to cycle to parks, shops, schools, the beach or hot pool, while tourists travel safely from the other side of the world to visit these facilities, particularly the hot pools and the beach. By dismantling, I repeat, dismantling kilometres of installed cycleway, the DCC have reinforced a stay, a stay in home culture where kiddies are amused by technology and learn how to be couch potatoes. This put and take council roadway is unsafe as it potentially leads towards our high suicide statistics. Think about it. The council has responsibility, a responsibility to the community to provide safe outside facilities that encourage independent, confident relationships, relationship skills in all children. First come the safe facility, only then can parents demonstrate trust and confidently encourage their children to cycle. The most powerful thing any council can do is nothing. Because nothing begets no criticism, at the same time it creates the most pain for residents. I submit that for decades the DCC has done nothing for South Dunedin residents and this plan changes nothing and therefore is guilty of continuing the most insidious depravity of public services, public services to the largest sector of residents in the smallest physical area. The 10-year plan seemingly does, not, seemingly does nothing to change continued abuse of southern citizens, southern city, city citizens. By all means, and I'm just about to finish, by all means be bold and show leadership and spend an extra $10 million for permanent international recognition like the Sydney, Sydney Opera House on a super bridge which will show a return on its investment within two or three years and be profit generating, hopefully, for my southern city community's generations to come. Please show me where this 10-year plan addresses my contention that the Dunedin City has an endemic, autocratic aversion to a realistic costing of effective communication with the multiple cultures, groups and all 28,000 residents in the South Dunedin community. I'd like to say thank you for giving me your time to my voice. This is, a great, this is our great democracy at work. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Right. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Westwood, for your presentation. And I, I, I hear your point around communication. And you noted earlier on in your presentation that South Dunedin does not have a community board. Um, I went to a meeting that South Dunedin Action Group called around about 10 months ago. Um, and in it, there, it was floated to the floor that did the people of South Dunedin want to move forward on developing a community board? and it was voted down quite resoundingly at the time. Um, I, I, spoke, I spoke to that meeting at the time when they asked and said I felt that community boards offer a very important role, which is to actually advocate for their region. Agreed. Um, we, but a community board has to be a, a requested for by the population. True. Um, so the council can't form one, people in South Dunedin have to request one. Um, we also have funding for place-based groups coming forward to be considered in the long-term plan, which again is an opportunity to fund groups that can speak for their question. Do you, well, it's an observation that relates to Mr Westwood's presentation, which is it's very hard for us to interact with a group in a community if there's no representative group to come and speak to us because we end up speaking to 25,000 individuals. And that becomes very difficult in the communication plan. Yes, agreed. Technology has created the problem where we can have many means of communication, but we have no knowing that they've received the communication. Sending emails, which is the cheapest cost, which we rely on the most, is the most unreliable because we don't know if the emails have been received. Technology offers many ways. You can phone, you can text, 
you can send a message on Facebook and you have to do all of those to ensure that it actually gets through. So therefore, a budget is required to get around that so you are communicating in this 21st century with your, uh, with, with your principal residence. Can I just ask a question of the Chair too? I know, I know that in the formal, in the past, this is questions only and no comments, but are we in a period of experimentation with consultation? Um, because I did elicit an answer yeah, from, the, from it, the presenter. It's about practicality. We, 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 if we get too far into discussion, it just blows out and we can't, we can't cope with it. So, and we do that in deliberation. So um, I, and I'm, I'm trying to be um, flexible as I can um, because we, we want good interaction. But if it becomes just discussion and observations by councillors, then, then we're not actually focusing on what we want to hear, and that is from the, from the submitters. So, so that's uh, in the family thing. Um, any further questions? Councillor Wilson, did you ask? Well, I, I'm... I'm I w we had an interesting um, submission earlier in the week by a lady called Eleanor Doig, who was representing a number of groups and mm -hmm. actually congratulated us with some of the um, consultation in South Dunedin. Yes. And um, so I'm, and and I know that this year, through the plan, we, um, through the consultation work, we've gone out, I think, broader than ever before. So I'm just wondering, what what mechanisms are the, your preferred mechanism? for consultation and what times are the best? I mean... Right. I, can, I think I can answer that. There needs to be a permanent hub in Dunedin where councillors have re regular clinics where we can come to to talk to it because it's a small area. People can walk or they can come on their um, uh, senior citizen trolleys, uh, motor um, tr trikes, um, and effectively we can travel to it, but we need that hub. We need a permanent council presence. There is not a presence, to my mind, in South Dunedin okay. of this council. All the facilities are in the, in the center of the city. We want to get beyond the square box and beyond the octagon and think outside of the octagon and look at the whole. We need to form partnerships with all the the tourist things that are around us. There's a, there's a belief, I think, in Dunedin that that the public, that the, uh, the the tourist facilities owned by the council go their own way and leave the private tourism side alone. We need a strict partnership that works. We need a partnership with with the Invercargill. We need a partnership with Queenstown so we d dig a ditch to bring the cash that the people from overseas bring down into the city. It's turning over as much as Auckland nearly in some areas with the overseas funding going into it. Sorry, I should... I should no, 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 that, 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 no, that, 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 that's... No, I think that, I've answered the question. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. And I'm sh sure that um, many of the councillors... It, it's sometimes about the community inviting councillors to come to things as well. And I'm, I'm very aware that many of the councillors around the table do do that. So please, can I encourage that as well? Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to check with you, and you might be surprised to know, did you know that there is a relationship between uh, our council and other RTOs, regional tourism, and that's an active thing. Would you be surprised to learn that? No, I'm not surprised to hear that because there's, it's, it's a rule, the 1% rule, rule the, the essence of things and the, and the bottom people don't have a say. Um, the, the majority of the larger tourist facilities in Dunedin are run by the council businesses. The minority of the larger ones are left alone, hence we have submissions earlier this week like we had them. And it needs to be a partnership. It needs so, to be so linking we, together and drawing them in. Sure. And so I would, speak, would you be surprised to learn then that, in fact, there's partnerships in all sorts of marketing uh, of the city? So some of those private uh, sector organisations do uh, commit money along with council in partnership to promote the city? Yes, I hear that you do commit money, and I accept that. I don't know the detail, obviously. But I, it's a people-based thing here, and, and I use, for example, nature Wonderlands down the bottom of the peninsula, um, which, which is isolated but draws tourists from the other side of the world into its area. They should be working in partnership with the with the facility just down the bottom of the hill from there. Um, it, there's some big gaps that have been created that people aren't aware of, 
and I'm just highlighting a few of them that I see. So can I just ask you, because I'm a little confused uh, in your submission, I just want some real clarity about it. What's the single most thing you're asking us? A presence of the council in the south of Dunedin where the greatest level, where 20% of the population is approximately. And you don't consider the hub to be that presence? A pop-up hub, I think, is an insult. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Westwood. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate your submission. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm. Right. So, councillors, there are two more um, presentations. Um, the one from the university we anticipate will be a bit longer than five minutes, and I think there's two or three um, representatives from the university coming for that, but they're not scheduled till 12.30. And yeah, there's four people, four people coming, um, and then there's. I take it that Ms. Cotem is not here yet either. So we will just have to tie ho until type twelve thirty. Oh. Right, our councillors, could we reconvene, please? Take your seats. Chancellor and crew, welcome. Uh, very good to see you here and thank you for accommodating our um, time needs, so it's great. So the floor, is, the floor is yours. Yes, when the red light in front of you is on, you have to press, press that and if the red, light, the red light's not on at the moment, so that's it, you're on. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship and councillors. We really appreciate this opportunity to submit on the 10-year plan and can I just say on behalf of the university congratulations on the vision and the optimism that's entrenched in this plan. It's really reassuring when it, it's, it sig signals in, our, in the university's view uh, a fine future for our city. So thank you for that. Uh, you'll be aware that the university at the moment is undertaking major, a major development program and has spent is spending uh, significant dollars and has already spent uh, s several hundred million and has got a program at the moment which is running at about 40 million per annum in terms of the Dunedin campus. And I'd like to introduce the team I have with me, sir. I've got uh, Mr. Uh, David Perry on my right, who's the Director of Campus Development Division. And I have Mr. Gordon Roy, who on my left, immediate left, who recently joined the University's Strategic Architect from Edinburgh. Uh, I also have uh, here present Kirsten Tibbet, who's with Mitchell Daish, who's been helping as a consultant in this matter. The Vice Chancellor of the University, uh, Professor Harleen Hain, unfortunately couldn't be here today, and she sends her apologies. She's out of town. Can I just say that in terms of what the university is anxious to support, of course, is the suggested contribution in the plan towards a precinct development. The, the, uh, the, the proposal for the public streets within the tertiary precinct is admirable and we laud that because at the moment you, are, you will be aware that the university has invested considerable money in the in the upgrading of the streets within the university campus, for instance, along Castle Street uh, and Union Street, uh, those streets now have been, um, have had about $8 million spent on them and bringing them up to that standard. The university being a public university, it's really important that there's free access from the, uh, for visitors and for members of our city when it comes, citizens, when it, and, and it's really great to see people now sitting on the steps in front of the clock tower or on the lawn having picnics and things like that. It's absolutely marvellous uh, to have the university open to all. But the university does have a, has been ranked quite highly in terms of surveys and things about its amenity values and its heritage aspects. So we want to try and sustain that uh, ranking as much as possible and, pr and promote the university as a destination and for visitors who are visiting Dunedin. At the moment we do get a lot of visitors through the university and that's marvellous. 
The issue about the upgrading of the infrastructure, the underground works and the streets throughout the precinct uh, brings into focus the fact that there does appear to be a small section at the western end of Albany Street between the, between the intersection of George Street and down to the uh, to where the Captain Cook building is. That section, it's, it looks like it's a bit of a lacuna in the overall integrated development and upgrade. We have all the streets within the tertiary sector being upgraded, but there's just that section. And it may well be that the council within the 20 million would be able to look at accommodating that because the need for a seamless integration uh, particularly with the new works that are proposed for the city centre and also the, um, as a testament to, to the edge of the really a statement as to where the tertiary precinct starts at that stage. I appreciate we've got a, so, a southern precinct, of course, a south precinct with the medical school and so forth, but Albany Street is a, is a good defining point for the precinct because if you're going to the stadium or something, you a lot of traffic walks down there through into the you know, go through the university campus, uh, as it were. Now, uh, as far as the the um, the amenity and the landscape values of the university are concerned, at the moment, as you know, we are we are developing the the dental school, which is. Uh, at the moment is around about 130 million uh, and we've developed the science building which you may have seen uh, which is in Union Street which was 50 million and we're doing another 35 million dollars worth of development for the research building opposite the dental school and it's just great to see in Dunedin at least two cranes on the horizon at the moment uh, so that's that's marvellous. So the actual integration of the landscaping around those buildings and that, we'll need to look at that quite carefully as well because that's an uh, important area. As far as the... Um, because we're talking about the tertiary sector here, which includes the polytech area as well, we've got a huge advantage in... Dunedin in the sense that there's an identification of the of the tertiary area uh, and I'm not sure whether you are going to have submissions from the Polytech, I, I presume so, but we would of course be working with the Polytech and the city in terms of the integration of the amenity through that area. Now as far as the, uh, there are one or two things in the 10 year plan that I should for shadow in terms of our written submission, which I understand is coming later, uh, and and we will definitely be giving a, a promoting, uh, proffering a comprehensive submission. Uh, there's one thing I just need to flag, and that is the issue of the development levies, uh, which are covered in a separate section of the plan. Uh, at the moment, the development levies are set at a rate under the annual plan that indicates that probably the lift of the 10-year plan was accepted of about 35%, so that is a significant lift and something that we would, we will make a further submission on, uh, assuming we've got those numbers right, but that's how it appears on the face of the documentation. As far as the uh, central city upgrade is concerned, the university, uh, again, is very supportive of that. Uh, that we see that as being, again, a, a testament of where the city's going in terms not only of sustainability and transport and energy, but also in the whole, the, the whole ambience of the city. It's, it's, it's first class. As far as the harbour side area and the bridge is concerned, again, any um, development or uplift and activity in that area is, is strongly supported by the university. Uh, then we have the issue of city cycleways. Again, the university is very supportive of what's happening there and, would, and is conscious that if the harbour side development were to proceed, then that there's good interconnection with the university tertiary campus in terms of, sorry, of cycleways and walkways and so forth. 
The other matter, there was a matter that was raised at some stage about the Logan Park development. Uh, again, we will cover that in our, in our submissions. I don't, there's nothing I think we need to raise here, but just to foreshadow that there's, there was some discussion about the overall development of Logan Park, and of course that's a very relevant area uh, for both, both tertiary institutions. Uh, I'll just check. We had five minutes, I think, didn't we? I'm not sure how I'm doing. So I'm very uh, pleased if you have any questions. This is our master plan. There's been a lot of thought gone into the, the way the area is developed and to maintain the standards. So it's, we see this, this approach has been totally compatible with a strategic planning approach for the tertiary sector. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Sumbo. Um, are you happy to take questions now? Yes, certainly. So, Councillor Benson Pope. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thanks very much, Dr. Summerhill and colleagues. Uh, just a question about the, you raised the issue of Albany Street and, and final design and so on. Um, once, I guess, a decision is made about the quantum of funding in this area, um, clearly there's going to be some discussions with you about that, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you know that as part of the discussions about George Street, uh, or the central city work, uh, Albany Street, the block as far as Albany Street is being considered the one-sided block for the first time for uh, upgraded treatment. And so that leads, links with what you were saying. Can, I, can we assume, subject to further discussions, that those two walking routes, either up Albany or along Great King, closed or not, dental school precinct, up Frederick Street, are the key pathways or transit lines that um, you would see as the most important links to, to the campus from the city end? Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, Councillor. There also, there is, when, it, when you get major functions at the stadium, we also get a lot of traffic down Union Street between Uni, the back of Unicole there down to the stadium. Amazing amount of traffic comes through there, whether it's funnelled down um, Clyde Street, I suppose, and it's coming in like that. But no, exactly, those other ones are the main main routes. Can I also ask a question about the harbourside issues? Obviously, you're not in a position to make any commitment about involvement, but um, your support um, is very welcome. In general terms, though, um, can we assume that the university or various parts of the university um, will look with... Um, a positive, as positive a view as possible to the potential for joint developments of whatever kind in that area? Uh, yes, the university sees harborside development as being a, uh, a very exciting and important development and the university would like to be actively involved in the consultation and the, and the planning for that development, yes. Can, Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you. Um, it was with some sense of pride that I walked through the university after the Ed Sheeran concert with some ex-university um, attendees and um, their um, impression of the, city, of the areas of the city that you've done, so well done. Um, and, and also there are comments from a lot of people from out of town using that area, so it was very public, albeit done by the university. Can I just understand... We're relying heavily on a t up to 25% or 28% subsidy from NZTA when we do any of the work in the tertiary precinct project. Does the university get any of those subsidies when you do work on streets like Castle Street? No. So, so it is all capital out of the uh, out of the university. It's, it's just that there has been some highlighted um, submissions about. Why, why should we be supporting the university? They're not um, ratepayers. And I'm, I'm just getting that sort of contribution to the city um, <coughs> in balance. Yes, no, absolutely. If we're looking at a 10-year cycle in terms of the, the contribution that's gone into the landscaping and amenity values of the university campus have come from the university's funds. But to be fair, the Otago Regional Council put a considerable amount into the to the flood protection work along the front there, which has made a, which has opened up that area. Uh, the, when it comes to NZTA though, the issues of the one-way street system and all that sort of thing, 
the university would be interested to have a discussion about that. I can have. <laughs> Dr. Somerville, I'll go back to your comment about um, the amount of traffic that's generated by events at the stadium, and you mentioned uh, Union Street. I take it you mean both vehicular and pedestrian traffic? Uh, the, uh, an Albany Street and so forth, vehicular, down Union Street, the traffic, vehicular traffic's allowed, uh, it's moving very slowly. It becomes, by default, really, a pedestrian access corridor. Um, and uh, and I, I can understand, when it comes to the managing those public streets for events like that, that with a parts of them are closed or something to vehicle traffic may be an issue, but it's just the number of people walking right. down a mass down those corridors, which is, is marvellous. Right. And to have them, to have the streets well presented and, and so forth. Is so you're not, I, I, that's what I was trying to clarify, you're not presenting it as a problem or are you suggesting that as we learn more from each major event that occurs, yes. um, that we need to do some more coordinating or planning in that regard? Can I defer to Mr Perry sure. here, who's the campus development director? Mm. Uh, no, we appreciate that with events of that magnitude, there's a wider area that needs to be uh, considered. And I think it worked pretty well for Ed Chair and the feedback that I've got, as long as there's early consultation about what the plans are for street closures or parking areas that will need to be managed in and out. Um, we're more than happy with the, for that to work, and as long as we can work together on Thank you very much, um, Dr. Summerall, for your presentation. Um, when we're looking at the George Street redevelopment, we're looking at potentially a targeted rate for properties that face out onto George Street that will be receiving some amenity. Now, obviously, we don't have that relationship with the university in terms of rating. Um, is there any opportunity, potentially, that the university and the Polytech may give us some contribution towards some of the expenditure that we're going forward on? I, I'm not in a position to answer that because at the moment the university is, its development projects are so enormous um, and we, and this long term plan was really focusing on the public streets. Um, but so, but I think, as I said earlier, I, I, Councillor, the object is to make sure we continue to discuss these things and work together in these integrate, in an integrated way. Uh, so, no, I, I'm, I would be probably, um, disenfranchised if I made a commitment here. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Could I endorse that from the university's perspective? The actual, uh, the tertiary sector group that works with, with the Polytech, the city and the university uh, is invaluable. So this, this long-term plan, it's great to see that those sort of relationships are acknowledged in the planning. So thank you. Councillors, um, we, we have a, a short council meeting to have after this, and it's a non-public one. And one option is, rather than clearing this room, we all just stand up, go into the council chamber, have the meeting, and then come back in here for the last, um, the last submitter. So can we, if everyone's happy with that, let's go and do it. No, no, it's only do one I'll do it the old-fashioned way. Aye. Yes.
person's not here yet. Well, they better be hurry because I'm like, going. Yep. Turn me off. Uh, <coughs> welcome. You're Jenny Cotum and you're our last submitter for the day. So welcome and uh, the next five minutes are yours. And you'll just need to press the button on the... That's it. There you go. Um, kia ora. I am Jen from Generation Zero. And we have a couple of things that we would like to um, convey to you in this hearing. Um, the first being that we really like the ambitiousness of your plan. Um, we support most of the major new projects for um, the business as usual, the Green, water, uh, Green Island Wastewater um, Plant and the Stormwater Improvements in this afternoon, sorry. <coughs> Um, will both, I think, dramatically um, reduce the risk of flooding um, and help us adapt to climate change. Um, and the city cycleways and transport improvements will, of course, increase the livability and the um, connectivity of the city. We 
however noted some things that weren't um, expressly kind of ex um, ex explained in the long-term plan. Um, firstly, that even with the proposed $200,000, um, the DCC is, um, might allocate for the TL2 dollar strategy, um, not all of the initial actions appear to be under that $200,000. And I would like to know why the initial actions um, aren't all being taken all at once. Um, we, however, support the um, investing in place-based community groups. We believe that that will help um, create a strong community, but also would um, help, I suppose, gain a little bit more trust and um, amicable feelings between the DCC and the community. Um, another thing that I noted was missing in the LTP, and I realise that this is under the, um, I suppose, governance of the ORC, but public transport. Um, we would like to express that in the first instance, we would like the DCC to help um, fund the public transport system, um, preferably through taking money from parking. And in the second instance, we would like you to consider lobbying um, the central government to change that law, um, simply because it seems to be a lack of coordination and it seems to be quite a prevalent problem around the country. Um, another thing we noticed there was a slight lack of was um, references to climate change explicitly. Um, I recognise that you guys have gone zero by 2050 and have endorsed the Zero Carbon Act. Um, but what I would and Generation Zero would like to see are some, I suppose, more solid plans on how you're going to get there and um, an amount of funding allocated to that. Thank you. Take questions? Yep. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. It's really a question for the CEO and whether um, the, all of the action plans under the environment strategy, did, I, I can't recall now, we got a report on how much that would cost? No. Right, yeah, okay, thank you. Just Councillor O'Malley. Thanks for your submission, Jen. Um, the government policy statement on transport has just come out and, they, and the government is now seeking feedback. So would you like to see, um, as part of the City Council's um, feedback, that we look at the Land Transport Management Act as it relates to public transport? Absolutely. Cool. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thanks, Jen. Um, at the formation of the new government, we did approach the Transport Minister and ask if he would be open to making that amendment. He's happy with the status quo currently, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, as an interim measure, we do have the capacity to form a joint governance arrangement uh, under the Local Government Act. Would you pro promote that as an interim uh, measure for us to pursue? Um, the Christchurch model? Essentially, yeah. 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 Um, I suppose it would, I suppose anything's kind of better than the status quo, <laughs> but if you're going to make a change, you may as well do it properly than make an incremental um, we'll give over a little bit of governance and a little bit of governance and a little bit of governance. Further questions, councillors? Around and Jenny, thank you very much thank for you your submission. Much. Appreciate it. Uh, and that, councillors, brings this meeting to an end. Um, There's one, one final wrap up from Councillor Staines, who's obviously been collating the statistics. As I usually do, we use some statistics. Um, so far, give or take a little bit, because I have to make a judgment sometimes on whether you have asked a question or you haven't asked a question. <laughs> and the rule I've been using is that if the submitter responds, then it was a question. So 470 questions have been asked so far. There's still two sessions to go. Um, and the most inquiring councillor is by just a, one question asked in that last submission, 
is Councillor O'Malley. Number two is Councillor Gary. Uh, number three is Councillor Elder. So I will be interested to see how it transpires over the two days that I won't be here. Right. So I, I need to clarify, councillors, that the, this isn't the, actually the end of the meeting. We've got two more sessions, so we're adjourning. There's still room for you to take the first spot. <laughs> right. All right.